right, welcome everyone to Natural Ones. I'm joined here as usual by Viktor Gorchev. And now, uh, this is a conversation I've wanted to have for a while, I have Griffith Morgan on. Welcome, sir. I'm glad you could come on and talk to us about all the things you're doing within the tabletop role-playing game world. I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, sure. I'm glad you invited me, actually. <laughs> I talked you know, to you I a while. Have... Go ahead. Well, I, was, I, talked, I talked to you a while back, uh, but, you know... Um, I don't know what Lord Mateus is saying. I, I wanted to talk to you a while back and then just never got around to like scheduling it. So I'm glad I just like, hey, let's have you on. <laughs> yeah, it's easier. I have a lot of people will be like, can we schedule you like three months out? And I'm like, God, I don't even know what I'm going to be doing three months out. <laughs> like yeah, people think you have like a game company and you run your business like some big corporation or something. It's like, no, we just do things. It's like whack-a-mole. You just do things when they need to get done, right? Yeah. So I'm easier to get a hold of this way. Uh, to Lord Mateus, I think I'm having some camera issues. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, but uh, hopefully, hopefully we you can, can hear see me. You right. <laughs> yeah, your sound is good, and you look fine from my end. All right. Yeah, cool. there's a little bit of the delay again, but whatever. Yeah. yeah don't worry about it. Just like a, just pretend you're watching an old kung fu movie, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'm glad you're on. I, I, this is something I've wanted to again talk about for a while. I watched The Secrets of Blackmore and I really, really enjoyed the film. Um, mm -hmm. I learned a lot about the hobby and it was really cool to see kind of the roots of everything. So I'm really appreciative that you made that film and that uh, put it out there for all of us to consume. I, I went and pur purchased it on Vimeo because I just enjoyed yeah. it so much. So. Well, Vimeo... The you know, uh, Amazon is kind of an e a necessary evil, but they take <laughs> half of what you pay for doing nothing, really. Whereas Vimeo, we get most of what you pay. And so mm -hmm. being a small film uh, with, you know, not a million people renting it, uh, it's better for us, definitely. Yeah. So anytime someone's asked mm -hmm. about the film, I've always directed them towards Vimeo because I remember you mentioned that you get a bigger cut from there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and that's kind of going on with like people have been saying the same thing about uh, drive through and, and some of the other resources. And I don't want to start a drop war with drive through, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's like, well, you're just hosting files. Like, why are you charging so much is the question. Somebody's come up with a new site yeah. that's cheaper that I'm sort of looking at actually for my own stuff is just put it on that site. Maybe do uh, a couple titles, you know. Big Geek and Volume by, by chance? Yeah, I think that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. And so we're I'm both on that as well. So, yeah, so mm -hmm. I'm thinking maybe putting a couple little, like, uh, you know, just like ten page modules on there or something like that. Um, but my my real focus isn't really to produce something that's pre made that you use. It's I'm much more focused on the idea of tools that can help you help guide you toward traditional role playing styles. And so they would be more like, uh, I don't know, like I'll I'll give you a kit that comes with wool and knitting needles and then you get to make the, your own adventure out of that <laughs> yeah you know? i i like those kinds of tools though you know that's that is i i feel like the old school way of presenting content yeah um, you know like i i'm running my players through palace of the vampire queen right now oh wow and that's an uh, old one it is and uh having lots of fun and i love how toolboxy it is you know there's no yeah. there's, the, there's the thinnest story oh the princess has been captured and you got to go get her um here's a dungeon right. it's filled with monsters so I, I like that because then it allows me the more the less you give me, the more I'm able to kind of make it my own. And I, I like the, those kinds of toolbox kind of tools. And the players aren't as restricted because if they do something, if it was, a, I don't know, a lot of the newer stuff is really just a railroad. Mm -hmm. And the, it's like the players have to go to point B. They have to be at point B because that's where the key to point C is. And yeah, um, so if you have it a little bit looser, you can sort of. Uh, keep everybody on track regardless of what they do and they never know when they have fun right yeah <laughs> um anyway i i, I don't know we were going to talk about tonisborg did you want to talk about the movie do you want to talk about tonisborg um, um do you want to talk about role playing you know I, we really didn't plan this at all no uh, whatever we want to talk about really i know that you want to talk about tonisborg and i want to as well too because i know that's like uh that's a big thing you're doing right now too after yeah this film. Is, yeah, we're about to, we're really close to launching the Kickstarter for it. Um, a lot of people wanted copies. Whoop, there we go. It's yeah, pretty. I need to get one. <laughs> bling, bling. That's yeah, that looks Ken, great. Fletcher, Ken Fletcher drawing from, um, this is from the 70s. I can't remember what date it was. It might be like 79 or something like that. Um, and uh, 
it has the, I mean, I think people, the reason they should buy this is because it has these really old maps that are from 1973. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to, maybe if I put it, whoop, I, I can make there, you, put it in the shade bigger, a little I bit. Here. Um, but like, that's, but what's interesting here is that you have this map. I don't know if it's very in focus, but it's in different colors. And the reason for that is that the remaining, what remains of Thomas Borg is actually a set of Xeroxes and they had been made by David McGarry. And then they, when the maps got lost, he didn't realize he had an alternate set. And he actually went in and highlighted everything with colored markers to show the different sections that aren't connected to other sections. Mm. Um, he's kind of, he's very process oriented like that. He's kind of interesting. Like uh, if you've ever played dungeon board game, it looks like a dumb board game, but I talked to him a lot about the whole process he went through in order to, and I don't remember all the details, but in order to make it so it was balanced so that people didn't say like, I always play the elf because I always win. You know, if I play the elf, it was like, <laughs> um, you you know, sometimes different characters win and, and it's because he was able to balance it mathematically based on what was on each level. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about Tonus Board. We're about to launch the Kickstarter. Um, the big thing for me is just that Tonus Borg is uh, kind of a manual on how to play in the old way. Um, there really isn't a lot out there. When Dan Boggs and I were working on the manuscript, uh, that was just kind of our focus was, you know, people aren't playing in the old way. They're being sold this game that's not very well written these days. Um, mm -hmm. 5e is is like the prose is just abysmal and illegible i got a, a starter set and i couldn't make heads or tails of how the thing's supposed to work as a game you know <laughs> and then on top of that they don't really explain to you the whole role playing aspect and i think a lot of people don't really even know they don't fully understand what role playing is you know uh, you talk in silly voices like matt mercer right is that what it <laughs> yeah that's that's role playing yeah um yeah um so yeah i mean what else i don't know we've got i mean well, that's i can, kind of, I can show ahead. the the sample you sent me here and we can oh maybe, yeah we can uh we can look at this here i kind yeah. of zoomed it in so we could everyone now can, I can have read to look it at the here screen too. <laughs> um oh, there we go so there's a lot of stuff in this and you know i'm glad i'm glad you're doing the kickstarter for this because when i saw it and i was like this is amazing i want this and then it was done there was there's no more and then when you look on the secondary market for this book and it's going for three to five hundred dollars oh, over 500 <laughs> yeah um that's um, that's rough yeah so i'm glad that uh in the future at some point here uh, i will definitely be back yeah in. i mean we sold uh <laughs> i mean i won't i'm not ashamed because to say that our numbers are low you know uh we sell them at a high price because they're handmade costs a lot of money to hand make them and then um because we're a small unknown company um we don't sell a lot so the first printing was 200 i think it was 225 books 25 of which were black cover books uh for the people that were involved in doing the project and then 100 and i, I can't remember if it's 100 and it's 170 purples and 30 teal mm. we had to do it in two colors because of covid and so we let people decide you know what color they or if they if they didn't care what color they got then they went into the list that potentially got a teal if they were fine with just getting a purple then they just got a purple but it's still you know you've you've got a very limited number of there's 200 copies out there in the general public and then um and then and we have a couple that we held back so less than 200 and then we did another printing and we had them on sale on our website for about a year i think um some people uh had to wait a year they you know they ordered this book that costs 100 bucks and they had to wait a year till we got enough orders that we could say okay we can pull the trigger on this and get these bound, printed and bound and um so there's maybe just around 100 red covers that were sold through that and uh um ooh, we got a tonic board player on, on, yeah. on lord matthias is tonic yeah lord is great. yeah it is great isn't it <laughs> um and then uh yeah so like the the first printing that the two editions of the or the, the first edition both printings is like you know 300 books roughly um and then we're going to do another printing of the of this edition um 
So we're not going in and fixing any problems. There are a couple little, you know, a missing period there or something could have been written better. We're just not going to worry about it and just keep putting the book out. Um, and then what else is there? Yeah, so they're just very, you know, they're hard to get, but uh, we're hoping to help people get them soon in the next week or two. Yeah, um, I'm going to be keeping my eyes peeled for that. Uh, as far as the price, Adam Black here says mine was only 100 considering the average five five ebook is 50 it was a steal so yeah it's a good deal you know <laughs> um i mean i you know i don't mean to offend anybody but you know you got this book here um this thing is made it's handmade you know it's it's handmade in the united states it's bound in the united it's like printed and bound in the united states by people in america it kind of supports crafts people in 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 trades that are just almost disappearing we're told that in the nine state area we're in this is the only place that does this kind of binding anymore. Um, has this beautiful, beautiful little uh, go that way. Yeah, that's what marker, I love. Yeah, marker I love ribbon, seeing books with that. You know. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 really nice. And so, um, not to be offensive, but you know, some you know, do do you know if your book is that you bought for fifty dollars is being uh, assembled by Uyghur slaves? I don't know. Well, I'll say my five ebooks, uh, my monster manual completely fell apart and my player's handbook completely fell apart. Like the pages just, the glue came out, it's undone. So they just explode, right? They're so yeah. cheap. Yeah. 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 And I won't... paid like 40 bucks for 40, $50 for it. So I didn't grab my monster manual or my player's handbook. They're somewhere around here, but those books, um, my, my, uh, my dungeon master's guide is in pristine condition. It's, it's like, it looks like somebody used it for maybe two months. It's barely <laughs> even used. And uh, that was put out, what, in 1979 or so? So we're talking 40, 44 years, 43, 40, 44 years ago. And it still is is a perfect uh, book, you know, whereas uh, the stuff you're getting now is so cheaply made and they're charging you so much for it. It's like, mm, why am I wasting money on this product that's <laughs> garbage, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and then the content within is actually not super great either. And, you know, that brings us to, the, to Tana Sapporo too here. I think people, if you're not sure what it is, like just looking at the table of contents here. Yeah, scroll all, through it, you know. There's a lot in this this book that is uh, crazy. Like I shared it with Vic here in a, in a private chat and another admin on my Gilded server in uh -huh. Crossface, the other admin. He was like, oh, my gosh, like this book is bigger. He, he thought it was just the dungeon. And right, I was like, oh right. no 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 it's it's more than just the dungeon it has like dm uh advice and tips yeah. uh and, and advice and all that good stuff and then you have the um let's see uh you have the actual dungeon in here the, the dungeon yeah. of tonisborg and then you have rules you actually have a whole rule set in here as well yeah which, yeah which is impressive for what it's about have. roughly a third um, history about dungeons and dra like dungeons, history about dungeons and their creation and how to use them, how to play in the old way. And then uh, maybe uh, another third, the dungeon. And then the last third is like the rules and all the treasures and everything. Maybe the rules are a little bit bigger, but um, it, it kind of has to be extensive just because of like all the spells and treasure, magic item descriptions and monster descriptions and all those things. Yeah, that uh, GM advice chapter looks really interesting. I'm actually yeah, probably out of all of it, that's probably the one I'm the most interested in. <laughs> well, especially yeah. especially if you want to learn how to the old school, I think, mentality. I think that's something mm -hmm. like even me, as someone who's yeah, been playing a lot of OSRs and I love OSRs and it's it's this is my space now. This is where I want to game. There's still so much yeah. for me to learn. And so because I'm I'm a youngin, obviously, you know, I'm not I wasn't well, okay. I was <laughs> I wasn't born yet when when a lot of this stuff was even I was even a, a glimmer in my father's eye when when this uh, when these when these ideas were were first put to paper and people were playing them. Yeah. But uh, I I love the the old school way of play and, and how all that goes about. So like looking at this, I'm like, oh wow, there's so much good good stuff in here. Um, yeah, I mean, there's you know, it's it's well, just to go back to like how the game evolved, you know, it's it's uh, I think people. Well, especially in the historical community, people are really obsessed with rules and where did they get this rule? Where did they get that rule? You know, mm -hmm. and um, most of what Wesley and then and Dave Arneson and then Dwayne Jenkins uh, were doing was really unruled. It was it was all about the referee. Um, it's it's like 
reasonable, having reasonable expectations of a situation. And then, and then the referee tells you a reasonable result, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so for a lot of the things, I mean, people like, I like to call it a hand wave, but it's really not a hand wave. It's a judgment. You know, the the referee is reality and reality has, has judged that, you know, you tried to pick up this giant stone with a weird teeny little rope and you got it a little bit off the ground and the stone broke and crushed the guy that was trying to crawl underneath there or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's just, that's the, you know, there's no, you don't get a saving throw. I'm sorry. You were doing something stupid and, and you get a deadly result. You know, I was playing with the butter knife in the light socket. What happens? You know, <laughs> reasonable <laughs> result is you're going to get electrocuted. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, the play style is kind of like a really big deal. And that's kind of what, that was kind of the whole thing with this book was uh, um, going through, maybe scroll up a little bit more so people can see other titles. I don't know. But um, in that section or down, I guess, however it goes. Um, there's yeah, right here. You got a chapter called the dichotomy of rules versus rulings. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, it's important, you know. Um, and uh, so it's funny because people were, would, people try to say like Dungeons and Dragons is a role-playing game and everything that came before it isn't. And it's like, yeah, but you've got tunnels and trolls. It's a role-playing game. It doesn't have any of the rules that Dungeons and Dragons has in it. It has dice pools for combat. It has spell points. In some ways it's a better design than original Dungeons and Dragons. Um, Mm -hmm. And people sort of overlook it, but it's a great game. Um, It's much better written than the original Dungeons and Dragons. They actually have concise prose that explains how it works (laughs) as opposed to like, you know, I mean, I love, I, I, I talk bad about these books. Right. But um, I mean, this guy here, you know, there we go. Yeah. This guy here is uh, that's, that's kind of the original player's handbook. And this is kind of the original monster manual. Don't have it on full screen. There you go. And then this is your kind of your DMs guide. Um, it wasn't really broken out that way back then. But um, I mean, these are not, this is not a lot not of a information. Lot. They're each about 60 pages long. They're like a piece of paper that's like, um, you know, full, like a, you took a piece of paper and you folded it in half. And so 30, 30 pieces of paper and you folded them in half and stapled them with a cheap cheap cardboard cover um so um that's kind of what what i don't think a lot of people get back i see a lot of people writing clones for ot for these three books here that i just showed you Mm -hmm. um and all they're doing is re-ruling and uh maybe making it putting in more rules and and maybe in some time some ways putting too many rules in there and removing the player referee dynamic from the game and so uh I, you know, I just think that the play methodology, the the, the pure play method is, is almost a, a no rules uh, sort of system. And uh, I hate to use the term storytelling, but it's more like story and environment creation. You are immersed mm-hmm. in a story environment and, and what you say you do is what, what you do. And there are going to be results. Um, so I don't know. That's my rant. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I think... Hmm? Oh, no, you mentioned the original prose, and that's definitely a stumbling block for somebody like me. Like, English is my second language to begin with, and then you add, like, Heike Gaxian to that, and it's like, what's he saying? Like, like, it it definitely (laughs) takes me, like, way longer to translate. And that's why I like uh, Old School Essentials, because it just takes, like, you know, BX and just rewrote it to be, like, way more concise and just more clear, so. Right, Uh, yeah, I hear that, too, you know, and that seems like a reasonable... You know, it's a reasonable thing to want to buy something that you understand as opposed yeah. to getting something like this that you don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I mean, that was kind of the, the great thing with when in 1977, they released the basic set. Um, um, Holmes, the Holmes edition was the first time that anybody who actually knew how to write decent prose sat down and wrote a set of rules and people could buy that. And it was it was fairly clear what the rules were. Um you know, Gygax, Gygax can write a lot, but I think even when he, when they did Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, if they didn't have Tim Cask there as editor, I think Tim probably contributed a lot more than people are willing to give him credit for. Mm. And, and uh, um, yeah, so, you know, it, it's just nice to see clear prose for sure. 
Um, mm -hmm. I should probably do a series of videos on how to, you know, how do you play these rules? That'd be <laughs> cool. Yeah, you know, I, I was always under the the. I was always told, and I think you corrected me on Twitter, that like you kind of need to understand chainmail and a few previous things in order yeah. to play OD and D. And I think you had told me like, no, in th those books are complete enough in order for you to play them, just from those three books. Uh, yeah, I mean that's the thing that the 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 fallacy. You know, there's this this Gygax obsession, and um, it's because Gygax would write editorials in the Dragon. And so D and D fans were fanboys then, just like they are now. And so Gygax would proclaim something like the Pope and Kong, and everybody would <laughs> yep. believe it, right? And um, the, and also, you know, when Arneson went to introduce the game to to Gygax, he he was trying to convince him to to like this thing. You know, it's a weird thing. Nobody's ever done it on the planet outside of the Twin Cities. Nobody's ever played it except for that night with Gary Gygax and his son and uh the, the the kunz brothers right so um they were mcgarry talked about like yeah i was working as you know as a player i was working really hard to convey how interesting this concept is and that it's something worth publishing um and we you know i was worried that we were gonna like run a game and they just weren't gonna get it and they'd just be like that was stupid you know <laughs> um and i mean that's how uh yeah, it was just so edgy back then. I think uh, people don't realize how different it was from everything that had ever come before it. Um, yeah, we take it kind so, of for granted now, especially yeah. with, with like video games. And it's so just, especially now in, in the age that we're in now, where D&D, &D, the logo is everywhere. And mm -hmm. Everyone's playing. They're playing fifth edition, but it's, it's, it's everywhere. Everyone knows what it is. So we kind of take it for granted. Uh, and we don't even, you know, like the, everybody, the, the, the marketing community, you know, or consumerists, the, the, the creators of things for consumers, um, glommed on to the whole idea of the term uh, RPG. And so you started having these computer games and they were calling them RPGs, but mm -hmm. they, they don't encompass anything that an RPG can do um, because there isn't the referee there to pass judgment and decide what is a reasonable result or decide that, oh, this is something that, you know, we need a die roll for so it seems fair to the players. But yeah. for a little while they called them C RPGs, like in the late nineties, early two thousands. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And I kind of missed that term because it kind of made it more clear, like what you were dealing with. Yeah, yeah. I liked the old uh, FRP fantasy role playing mm -hmm. because uh, it could be applied to anything. If, if if the word fantasy doesn't really mean specifically like a fantasy setting, but fantasy is in imagination. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. like we're playing a fantasy, a fantasy in space. We're playing a fantasy in the wild west. Um, yeah. Um, FRP always appealed to me. I keep trying to convince people we should go back, go back to that, <laughs> um, because the role playing term just doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really work. You know, no. I think a lot of people think that role playing is because of the term role playing. They think that role playing is simply play acting, and um, when you're playing a game, uh, and and you're you're immersed in the game, your dungeon master is immersing immersing you in a situation, and you've You've been told all this lore about the place you're going to, and uh, you, you're having spaces described to you or people described to you, and maybe a person comes up and tugs on, you know, a little girl comes up and tugs on the end of your tunic and says, my mistress wants to have a meeting with you. And you're like, oh, <laughs> you know, like, what should we do? But you're getting immersed into this environment. You know, you're affecting the environment. It's affecting you. Um, you're simulating all your senses. You know, obviously, you can't simulate what something smells like, but you say like, oh, it smells like, uh, like the other day I used the, the last game session. I was like, it smells like flowers, but it's sort of like violets. If you've ever smelled violets, they're really unique in that once you've smelled it, you can't smell it anymore until you go away and sort of cleanse your nasal palate. It just disappears. And oh. it's the most beautiful smell, but it just, it doesn't, it's not permanent, right? And so, uh, and then I was like, and then, and then the women who are talking to you, you hear their voice, you, what you hear sounds more like little tinkling sounds, like maybe water dripping into a pond or wind chimes kind of combined. But, but as they speak and you hear these tinkling sounds in your head, you, can, you understand it as language and you understand what these ladies are telling you. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, I've just immersed you in a little, I've just taken you in, right? I'm describing yeah. something and you're, you're, you just uh, smelled something in this game, right? And you just 
refer to something and and understand that you will understand the words that these ladies say. Um, and I have described before that point, I've described all these visuals and, um, you know, just actions that these people take and the things they say. Uh, so you're invite you're, you know, you're interacting with the entire, with an entire construct, a reality construct. And so when people talk about role playing and all they say is like, you know, like, Oh, I'm going to act like my character. It's like, Actually, in my group, we don't do a lot of acting, you know, but mm. I know, you know, I know when, like when Chris is playing his character, I know he doesn't have to say, you know, Ned says, you know, I can tell by the tone of his voice when, when his character Ned is, is saying something or when Chris is saying, I, I'm going to go over to the door and just see if there's anything irregular on the wall around it before I even touch the door. Um, there's a bit, there's a difference in tone, you know, and you get familiar with that tone. And that's 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 real role playing. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the, the essence of what, even with Tonisborg, you know, it's it's like we wanted people to understand the old ways, you know, and 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 that maybe the old ways because they're so simple, um, like the methods are simple. They're old methods. There's not a lot new. And oh, this one's a nice one. Look at this. Um, Oops, oh, there, there we go. Oop, I'll do it. Oh, yeah, nice. Yeah, that's one of my favorites in the book. Yeah, um, that's cool. um, so, yeah, we want to just teach people how to play sort of without rules, um, without having to rely on sort of a video game, like a paper video game reality, um, where the story, and I don't mean story like the story games, but story, the narrative dictates what happens rather than the rules dictating the narrative. I've even seen that with earlier editions where people will take advanced Dungeons and Dragons and the DM will create things and be really focused on how the different magical powers interact so they can create a particular creature or whatever. And um, I think that that kind of goes away from like, you know, the main thing is that the characters need to be able to come here and interact with this thing, whether they're fighting it or talking to it or running away from it. And uh, um, when you start to build these like, sort of they're mechanical it's like programming with with paper rules you know it's like computer programming uh you sort of ruin the, the essence of the game you know i think the this because you you talked about video games like that video game mm -hmm. pen you said pen a, a video game with pen and paper and yeah, I, think, yeah. I think what it was i made a video about it a while ago it's weird it's like there was a point where these games influenced the computer role-playing games the crpgs as they call them then mm -hmm. you know like it was yeah. They looked at what the old school gamers, pen and paper gamers were doing and are like, oh, can we get as how close can we get to that on our computers with no DM, right. no GM? And, you know, they didn't get very close, but they made something new and different that was fun in a lot of ways, different ways. But I think like it, it's weird. So like it used to be that like pen and paper games influenced computer video games one way. And right. now, now it's kind of gone full circle where it's like the, the computer games are like feedbacking into the pen and paper games and they're, yeah. <clears throat> they're influencing uh, the role, the pen and paper role playing games now. And I think that's why fifth edition is the way that it yeah. is and fourth and third was the way that they were, yeah. um, you know, it, it, because back, back then when, when computer role playing games were first coming out, they were, people were going in with the expectations of the old school D, D game and so they had that like pre-knowledge going into it and now it's the other way around they're going into the hobby with the pre-knowledge of like video games and right I, I think that's influenced a lot so they kind yeah, of want a zelda experience on yeah paper or something like that and, they, they yeah want a little da 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 when the <laughs> right when they find, yeah, yeah. And they find the, the i've heard of dungeon masters that have like they use sounds as like backing tracks to the play but they actually like I've used music, but I just let it run wild, you know. Just, sure, yeah, I do too. If it gels, it gels. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But I've had people tell me like, "Oh no, I have things queued up," and like when when they get close to the bad guys, like the big big bad evil guy theme thing is just like that's so video game, right? It's like, mm -hmm. um, it's it's literally the the whole idea of like the campaign is laid out as we're we're gonna go to like I don't know, they're like like ten scenarios, and at the very end is the big bad evil guy. And it's extremely linear. It's just like, wow, this is like going through the levels of one of these video games, you know. Um, and so uh, it is not 
anything I'm interested in playing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want a world, and, and then you know I'm gonna do stuff in that world. Oh, well, one thing I like doing is taking worlds from video games and turning them into tabletop like campaigns. Like I think that's fun. Like you know you could do like Resident Evil in Savage Worlds or something. Like I mean that sounds fun to me, but. I'm pretty, you have yeah, the time to do that, though. I mean, there is once you start building a world, like a campaign. To me, a campaign is something. Uh, you know, I played like Chris's brother and, and Chris and his brother and all those guys have this campaign, and uh, it started like around '79, and they're still yeah. running. You know, mm -hmm. they're still running. It's the same. People come and go. It's the same game world, and it's been yeah um, ravaged by. At one point, they all got to be like twentieth level, and they had a big war between the wizards and they were lobbying <laughs> basically lobbying nuclear weapon intercontinental ballistic <laughs> missiles at each other in yep. this battle and they redid the whole landscape and um but they still play there and like and and uh you know Greyhawk is still being played yeah um, and Blackmore of course is still being played after what 71 to now whatever that comes out to where like uh, over 50 years of yeah. a continuing a continuing uh, world reality, which sometimes people play in the future, in the past, but it's still the same world setting. So that's yeah. another strange one for me is that uh, the the marketing around rebranding the concept of the campaign as something much less and much more of a consumer oriented thing than the original concept of, of yeah. the campaign, which was you are in a living world and whether you show up to game night or, you know, or whether you do something or not, has, the, the world moves on with, with, that, with or without you, you know. You die, but the world persists and you come back as somebody else and time goes forward. Mm -hmm. um, well, well, the um, problem might be there might not be like a good term for like a campaign that has like a beginning and an ending. Like it might take right. you like 30 sessions, but there's an ending to it. And I don't think there's a good word for it. Like, you know, there's one shot, which means you just do like one thing over like one night. Scenario. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I guess scenario could work, yeah. Yeah or module, you know, that's what yeah. modules were really. There were a lot of modules that took more than one session to run through. Yeah. You know? um, I wonder if it's a, a problem of having too much too, you know, like I know for me, I get like a, like a oh, squirrel, like every time I see a new book or a new game and I'm like, yeah. I want to run that. I want to play that. And obviously you can't run everything. You can't play everything. So, yeah, this, yeah but I would, way. I would love, I've never done that. I would, I'm not old, old enough, but I'd love to have run a, a singular campaign setting for 40 years that sounds absolutely yeah. amazing because you're, you're almost making your own mythos like what you described with them lobbying like magical or loot nuclear weapons at each other and just right. changing the landscape like that's that's yeah. something that uh you know future characters in that world can like reference as this mythological event that occurred in you know oh, like the, you know the world was reshaped by these powerful wizards back in the day you know that's that's so cool um the guys I played with, well, in that campaign, I created a character and I built a city. And I, my character was Puma, which is based on the Italian word for Puma, which is uh, an ink, like a feather uh, that you write with. A, a, quill? A, a quill, yeah, a quill. Yeah. So his name was Quill in Italian. And he was kind of this, he's a magic user, but I ran him as sort of a scholar. Like we went into this one place and found all this old artwork and he was like rolling it up and running out of the dungeon with the artwork because he wanted to <laughs> He was like, you know, he's looking for for relics that can that he can study for historical importance and such. And um, now I've imported him into my campaign, and he's kind of a, a, a significant historical NPC in my own campaign's lore. You know, um, that's cool. Yeah, he kind of it's like there's a whole thing with my in my campaign having to do with the the, the goblins, the Gibelin is like well, the goblins to the humans, but the ancient goblins were known as the Gibelin, and um, um, and the Elfaren, which is the elves, and and a schism between the elves and and the and the uh, and the goblins in the past. And he's sort of a figure that found all these artifacts that are rare that nobody knows about because the elves are trying to suppress this ancient history because it doesn't make them look good, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and the dwarves know about it. They were actually in a in alignment with the uh, with the goblins back in the day, and and they still kind of like they're like kind of chill with the goblins. They're like, yeah. You guys do your thing. We'll do our thing. <laughs> but um, but anyway, so yeah, Pume is kind of this character that he's no longer alive. But um, there was a place where you find like a, one of the places he went to explore, and you find old notes and stuff in a notebook that tell 
kind of background on the story. I, um, I think that's something that a lot of modern gamers miss because you know i i'm sure you've heard of that statistic that the average modern game the 5e game lasts six sessions before it falls apart yeah yeah you know and that's really sad to hear because like uh my current game is a it's like a, a rule cyclopedia game mixed with a little, uh, basic fantasy a little bit and uh i think uh for this campaign because i moved and everything so i had to, we started a new play group right uh, this last year and so then January, it'll be the year anniversary of this new campaign in a homebrew setting. And so we've been playing consistently, like every week or every other week, at least, uh, for this whole year. And we're just barely, just barely, I don't know, I don't know how many sessions that is, maybe 20, 30 sessions in now. We're just barely, like, hitting our stride of, like, this This is super interesting. The players are really starting to get involved in the lore in the, of the world that, like, that I'm kind of right. making up and like, it's re it's, it's taken like almost a year to like hit our stride. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. And so I can't imagine like just doing six sessions and just having it fall apart. Like you, you're not even getting a little taste of what the potential is for a game. And a horror setting. I mean, horror settings, you know, the party sure. just gets devastated every time, you know, yeah, that, like, that, we're going to look around for things. And then the next session you find something and everybody's insane or half <laughs> of you have had your heads ripped off and, you know, and the other third are running for, for safety. It's like, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, like a real campaign, like what you're talking about. I agree. It's like, it's something that can go on and on and on. Well, yeah, and like, people I, I have feel, done that. You know? I, I feel like these days uh, with certain type of players, uh, the world almost plays second fiddle to the characters. And you've got characters that bring in like, 12 page backgrounds and then yeah. expect the gm to like weave it into their world even if it doesn't fit at all so like yeah, there's I like this a bit a of narcissism going on <laughs> it's funny you mentioned the word narcissism because narcissism yeah. because that's what i describe 5e is is kind of like the narcissist edition yeah um, and people you know like i you know i don't really care what you play um and people aren't are mostly going to buy that because that's what's in every bookstore around the country and all over the place and if you run into other gamers, the majority of them are playing that. Um, but there, you know, there are these little enclaves of people playing other games, not even original D and D. There's like, uh, you name it. There's there's so many games out there, and so many, so many genres, so many rule sets, so many games, and uh, um, but you're not going to find it in a store for the most part. Yeah. So yeah. But yeah. um, as to the Nars, oh, go ahead. I'm well, say like Five E. I, I feel like you can, you can run it uh, in a way that is. It's it's I I think it's gonna for me it's always hard to run. It's always going to be like inferior to like the campaign that I'm running now. Right. But there's there is a way to do it. You can import some old school sensibilities, but you're kind of working against the system in in some respects because it's it's not geared towards that. Um. Well, and I think that the, the the heavy mechanization of everything that you do, and this isn't a problem with 5e because I played Pathfinder too, and Pathfinder had that problem where everything was so heavily mechanized that people weren't interacting. I mean, it was, I mean, the, the most extreme example is just like, you know, all right, I walk in the room and look around, what, you know, what do I need to roll to see if there's anything hidden, right? And it's like, no, 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 no. You come into the room and, and it, you get a sense that it's some sort of temple. There's like a little alcove off to the side. There seem to be benches made out of stone carved out, of, you know, like along the walls. And um, there are pillars built into the walls and they go up and, and sort of like they look like columns, but then they turn into like tree branches or over the ceiling. And, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. um, like it's like, oh, OK. Is there anything else? Yeah, there are lots of cobwebs. You're going to have to like work your way through the cobwebs, and you know. And so there's the the what's missing for me is that uh, once again it's the the original play style, which is you're using your senses. The dungeon master is telling you what your senses are perceiving, and what your senses are perceiving is creating a narrative in your head that's visual and tactile and olfactory, and you know it's 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 your you're getting immersed it, and it takes a while and it's, and it's a slow process sometimes. But um, when you find something, it's like, yeah, you get the die roll to see that maybe there's an anomaly there, but now you got to figure out how to access the anomaly. You know, we push on all the bricks on the wall. Yeah. 
I throw a coin and there's a slot there. Maybe if I throw a coin in the slot, you know, or something. Um, yeah, yeah it's just a much different, it's, it's, again, it's a much different thing than just give me the die roll. Um, and, and I get, and I get the thing, you know, that, and that's how a lot of people play. I think it's that video game mentality, but you know, I, I think people are surprised, for instance, the way I run my games is like if a player describes what they're doing, what their character does in a very thorough way, I don't call for a die roll. Like if they're like, I'm going to spend 10 minutes right. and I'm going to search every brick on this 10 foot space wall. I'm going to put to try and depress them all in. I'm looking for I know there's a secret door here and I want to try and find it. Right. If, if they say and they, they vividly describe what they're doing and they do a good job about it and it seems reasonable to me, I'm like, sure, you find it. Right, you know, right, I, right. I, I don't need mm -hmm. you to roll for that. Like that would be you almost create a, a contradiction or a narrative problem if you if they describe what they're doing in such detail and you're like, okay, roll a d6. Oh, you you didn't yeah, roll you one. Didn't, you didn't yeah, roll the one to spot the secret door. So, like, well, yeah. there's the time. It's like a time investment trade off too. You know, like if you're, you know, if you're saying you're doing it that in that much detail while well, you're investing, you know, the party's sitting there while you're doing this and they're going to have to wait for like, I don't know, 15 minutes when you're doing this or two turns, three turns, however long it takes. Right. Yeah. And so there's the investment of time. And there's also the whole threat of, of course, in the old older games, there's the whole threat of wandering monsters coming along. So you're sort of, you want to be quiet, you want to be cautious, but you also are, are concerned about time. You have limited resources because you don't want to run out of oil and torches and be stuck in the dark. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then there's this constant threat of like, is something going to wander in the other door while we're looking around in this room or walking down this hall? Um, so like what you're describing is great. I mean, I agree. It's like, why, why say no when a player has invested that much time? Yeah. Instead of, instead of calling from the roll, like, yeah, I'll roll that random encounter dice, you know, uh, yeah. see, see if something, anything wanders into the room or sees them while they're doing it. But you know, a, a lot of modern players, when you tell them that, they're like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah. And, and I've played um, with people like my, my brother plays that way. I love my love playing. I love my brother and I love playing with my brother. But he's that kind of guy where he's a, a role player, R R O L L player. You know? Right, right. You know, I just want to roll dice. Like a little me, bit of both, you know. Yeah. I, I like a good mix. Yeah. I do, I do too, but I, I get like bored if there's no dice rolling because, like, why I'm playing a game because I want to roll dice. Like, there's all the interesting dice. I want to see like numbers pop up. I want like that random chance. So if it's like all uppy, I get just as bored if it's, if it's all rolls. So yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Um. Anyway, yeah, we've been kind of like going over all of this. I mean, I hate to harp on people. You know, like I don't care what you play. Really, enjoy what you play. <laughs> you know. But there are methods you can introduce to make your plate more interesting, like wandering monsters. Yeah. You know, and, and Re reaction roles, reaction roles. resources. Like you don't get to rest in the dungeon. You can't rest until you go to a safe place. Like home, yeah. You know, and so now you got to even, you know, you just run into the most weak encounter and you're like, do I waste my magic missile spell on these guys or do I save it for when we run into something potentially worse? <clears throat> um, there's a, that creates that sort of tension. Do I use it now? Do I use it later? Um, yeah. Um, anyway, um, I don't know. Moving along. We were going to talk a lot about Tonisborg. I don't know if we've talked about Tonisborg. <laughs> a little bit about it here. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're looking at the table of contents here, and it's just this first part here, breathing life into your old dungeon. Yeah. Um, you know, that's... Well, yeah. There's a lot of... I'm looking at everything in here, and it's like, real, there's a lot of interesting well, stuff. Well, like, is there any header you want to, like talk about or, or you're curious about about what you know what it means or what I mean, do you, you know think one pretty explanatory or one interesting thing that you and it's here in the sample um that i think a lot of more modern players i mean i know about it but uh a lot of modern players probably don't because it seems so iconic and like ubiquitous with the hobby yeah is is there was no thief right original. right everybody you know, was a thief everyone was a thief and you have a yeah. section in here that talks about that. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, I don't. I think I passed it. There's a. I saw it in here, but there was right here. I think. Uh, yeah, how to be thiefy without thieves, or just yeah. how old school is your game? Yeah, I mean, we kind of addressed that a little bit because that's something people. I mean, I, I I'm uh, very impressed with the original rules, and now that I sort of have taken a, a different look at them after many years, I see a lot of. Um, 
there's a, a lot of really interesting design that went into the idea. And this was a Gary Gygax idea. Everybody thinks I hate Gary Gygax and I don't. Um, <laughs> I thought this was actually rather genius. The idea that everybody has sort of a main profession and you're in a society, I mean, we're in a pre-enlightenment society, you know, there aren't, it's not like you go get your like bachelor's degree and while you're there working on your bachelor's in art or business or whatever, you're also taking a basic history class and a basic composition class and, you know, algebra or whatever. Um, um, people become real, we're really specialized in these old, it's like, you're the baker, like, you don't do anything else. You're the baker, right? <laughs> and so when you when you describe the classes that way, so when you come to the idea of the thief, I think it's interesting that the thief class, I mean, it makes sense. It's like you're sort of a, a criminal type. You know, you're not very good at fighting because you don't attend fight fight lessons. You know, um, you're more about uh, extracting somebody's wealth through trickery or something like that. Um, I see that mentality, but then I also think of like Conan. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. and he he was a fighter, but he also right. did thief thief like things. You know, t the, the Tower of the Elephant, like he kind of displays both being like a fighter and a thief at the same time. Yeah, uh, during that story, and that's obviously a, a character that has influenced the 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 feel and tone of of, of the hobby as well, that sword and sorcery feel. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of see both sides. You know, I see the draw of like I want to be specifically good at extracting wealth from people mm -hmm. but then also like uh i should be able to be like conan the barbarian and i should be able to fight and i should be able to sneak and break well i things. think that that's kind of the well like you saw the movie so you saw david mcgarry talking about he was the original thief a mm -hmm. little bit um, he talked more about it in his interviews which is what we were saving for the next movie um um and so the idea of being a thief I think the whole the whole concept of of a player can try anything they want to try, but maybe not successfully, is uh, can be applied to these things. And and the whole idea of the uh, like in the original D and D, the attributes were not really. I think what they were rolling for was much more of a, a vague, uh, an abstract sort of gradation of like low, medium, high, like low, medium, low, medium, medium, high, high. Like they were really just looking at these brackets of like aptitude and mm. that aptitude wasn't a direct correlation to like what I can do, but rather I have a knack for doing these things. And as I gain experience, I get more experience than other people because I have the inclination to do this more than other people do, which is built into the rules. And so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think the, the, the way the thief was created in some ways is a bit unfortunate because a, a low level thief is useless. Um, a high level thief is, is, uh, is mm. almost too powerful. And, uh, there is no challenge. I mean, now they do challenge roll. So, um, and that was something that really got introduced more in, uh, like in the labyrinth or in, uh, even I think tunnels and trolls might've been more like that where you would say, well, this is a, a three die lock. So you got a low roll three dice and you pick the highest one and that's, that's your success role, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, but if you go without thieves, sorry, I'm just rambling. No, go I'm rambling. <laughs> no, I mean, if you go without thieves, then everybody can be a thief. Um, I ran the group. I do a mixture of AD&D, or not AD&D, but like sort of everything OD&D that is nearly AD&D. <laughs> and also, because uh, it's very similar. If you if you do a close reading of the rules, there's they're very similar. Um, and then uh, I also will introduce characters like the last group, last session that we did, last three sessions that, that we did. Um, I just, I didn't even tell the players. I was just like, you got three classes. You can be this, this, or that, so this, you know, or you can be an elf, or you can be a dwarf, or you can be a halfling. Um, but the, the whole idea of the thief wasn't even introduced. And so um, it's more interesting because all the players are engaging with the reality more when it comes to finding things and, and there is no simple rule of like, well, I'm a halfling thief. I get, you know, a plus five with that. And uh, my base chance at this level is 20%. So I've got a 25% chance to roll, you know, to succeed. Yeah. And you roll the dice. Um, we're doing a lot more of what you're describing, which is like, if you're going to spend the time to go look at that thing, of course, you're going to find the thing, you know? 
Well, I, I think the 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 Conan type characters. That's pretty much why they put in like stuff like multi-classing or in newer games stuff like subclasses, just to kind of try like kind of like a fix basically. So because uh, all the old Conan like modules that I saw, they basically just gave him like different levels in the different classes. It would be like a level six barbarian, a level four thief, a level three fighter, like you know stuff like that. So I think that was yeah. kind of like the quick and dirty fix for like those kind of like. Uh, book characters that like right embody different uh you archetypes. know aspects yeah archetypes yeah well it's weird because even the difference between talking to like different players and and like i remember after the lord of the rings came out and i i don't know why i was talking to some probably 14 year old on the internet about magic <laughs> swords and and the kid was like oh sting is like a plus six sword you know and i'm thinking in od and d terms and i'm like that's a 30 percent bonus <laughs> that means that, like, when you're attacking an unarmored person, you're, like, almost always attacking them. And if you get a couple, you know, you go up to fourth level and you get another plus two, or maybe a strength, you've got a strength bonus in there, plus your plus two. Like, you're you're fighting at a ridiculous, you know, the plus three was the most powerful in the original D&D. And um, um, so, yeah, the whole probability thing is kind of interesting. I mean, the mathematical probabilities and as to, like, what you're talking about, trying to create these these literary characters, which in literature, of course, your main character is going to be successful with a little dagger, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, he's always going to succeed because if you don't, then you don't really have a good story. <laughs> yeah. But in the in the in the older editions, you know, death is is just right around the corner. It's palpable. It's not those who play the older editions like to grip it and rip it, and it's like, of course, I know I'm I might lose my character, like. 15 minutes into the game that's part of the, the part for the course right yeah um so i don't know where i'm going with that i just wanted to like sort of spin off of what you were saying because it did kind of we were talking about the literary characters and it's yeah. like like yeah i don't know how you create you know it's everybody's gonna get their own perception of what the literary character does yeah i was never much of a conan fan i'm really much more of a uh maybe king arthur lord of the rings kind of guy myself i i like both and, but and i just wanted to Wizard of Earth Sea, just <laughs> fantastic. I've not checked that out. I'll have to look at it. I just bring up Conan, though, because it's just, uh, I just think of Tower of the Elephant and how, he, in a lot of his stories, where he does a lot of different things, where, yeah. um, you know, he's sneaking here and he's like a master swordsman yeah. here, over here, you know. So it's like, there's, you know, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I'm interrupting. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was. Oh, I was just going to point. You know, Adam had a question that he's been like waiting for. Like, yes, I have it here. So we, it's probably a good time to transition. He asked it at the very beginning, but I was just waiting to get to it. So I didn't forget you, Adam. Don't worry. Uh, he had a question here. At some point, I'd like clarification or example of Harnison's protection point method that's on page 122. Oh, God. Yeah. You have to ask me that. Um, <laughs> um, the protection point method, I mean, is that in terms of uh, the dungeon stalking? I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't I have think it is, yeah. But um, let's see. That's in the rule. Uh, Dan does his interpretation of how he thinks it works. Um, I think Arneson published that in First Fantasy Campaign, which uh, it's, it's a little convoluted. I mean, those guys were really into their math. And so their whole system of like doing a dungeon, like Arneson's idea of protection points probably was more like um, it, it was probably the you know like the prototype for uh, uh what do they call it crs you know yeah um and and dan wrote that and so what i would say is look for dan's blog hidden in shadows go to his blog and ask him a question there because i think dan would be able to clarify that more for you i don't i don't use that system when i run i use griff's um, fake it till you break it system for stopping things because <laughs> I just know it so well. Uh, yeah, he says here, it seems like the old hit dice stocking rule seems simpler and easier, but I want to make sure I didn't miss something with the right. method. Yeah, I don't remember what it is. I mean, I got the book here. I could just probably look at it. I just don't think people want to like look at me reading, looking at my own book. <laughs> but these are Dan's rules, and he called these from a lot of different old manuscripts, like pre D and D pre D and drafts and stuff like that and um so he, and then he also put some things in there that are kind of like more modern um like the variety of weapons i think there are weapons from a lot of different cultures in here that um 
you can you can use and buy and use in my game i'm sort of more like we're in medieval land and you're not allowed to do that because it's just not culturally it would just be an anomaly that that it would be like metagaming you know yeah um so yeah i would say the i mean i hate that's a horrible answer sorry adam um <laughs> But the rules are Dan's rules. I don't play those rules. I'm a I'm a I'm strictly an OD and D guy. I play OD and D, and I I heavily like home rule it and stuff. And um, so yeah, it's just you know I can't really say a lot about it. I have a question then too about the rules that are present in the game here or in your book here. So, um. Is this like your like homebrewed version of of how you run OD and D, or is it some kind of proto D and D that like Arneson and, and a lot, that whole gang ran before it was published? Um, it's what Dan did was he's Dan's interesting because he has his background is archaeology. I think pretty sure it's archaeology. I mean that's what he does professionally. He's like a uh, you know he works. I think he works at a museum now. I don't keep track of every detail of Dan's life because we just talk <laughs> gaming, you know, but um. So he's a heavy duty research guy. And so whenever he would find some draft out there that people were talking about and publishing fragments of, he would just file it away. And then he would study it and study the numbers on it and see how it related to other things. And so what he created was many years ago was a thing called um, uh, Champions of Zed, which Zed being a reference to zero, Champions of Zero. And, uh, um, he just basically went through all these drafts and kind of created like, you know, what, what he could glean from say first fantasy campaign and what he could glean from maybe comments that Gary Gygax made later about what they were doing before they published the game. Uh, so it's a little bit filtered through Dan's ideation, you know, but I think it's a, it's a solid system. I mean, it's very playable. I just don't use it because I'm so, uh, so familiar with how I run OD and D that it's easier for me to just like, I don't even need the charts anymore. I just kind of think about like, ah, oh, yeah, these works might be a little tougher. You need to roll like a, you know, a 14 to hit these guys. Cause they're a little tougher. You know, <laughs> Like I, it's never, I never run it flat uh, by the book. You know, these, these guys are a little tougher. They, I, you know, Oh, you don't players, do rules as written. Oh, well. No, not at all. <laughs> I do it made up as as I feel it is the way I. The only thing I don't do is cheat by making it up on the spot. There, there yeah. is a, you know, I'll go through and I'll be like, okay, these guys are this and these guys are this, you know, um, uh, or you need this is what you need to do to get through the door, you know. Um, but unless it's something really strict, like I don't know, people haven't. There's one thing I put in here that was an idea I had in my campaign. Which actually, I used it twice. Once in this in the in the uh, space station sci-fi campaign that was kind of like a mashup of of Tecumel and uh, uh, Metamorphosis Alpha and OD and D, and and then I used it again in another dungeon as like a pattern on a floor. And I actually used the the designs themselves, but um, like this is a very specific thing that, like, uh, you yeah, know, there. Mm. You know, that was that comes from the sci-fi game, actually. And this one over, whoop, uh, we'll do that. This one comes from another game and was actually like a, the, the, the squiggly one was a pattern on the floor. And that was kind of like, uh, you ever see like uh, Nine Princess in Amber, that novel, where they have the maze and you have to walk the maze. Um, and so what I, I, those are sort of the sort of puzzles you, you can only solve it by doing it properly or you will die. I mean, I'm just yeah. like... Like you have to figure out what the pro, you know, what the pattern is. You can't just follow the line because usually there's a logic. Like you must always turn to the right, or you must turn to the right and then to the left, and then the right and then the left, or like a pattern like that. And maybe you'll find a clue somewhere that will tell you what that is. Um, but um, um, a lot of times I do things where I do not like just to the idea of like everything being pre-generated and pre-arranged. I don't say like. You can only get through this door if you cast this spell, you know, or if you use this magic item. If the players, it's back to what you were talking about, about the freebie, you know, like if the players come up with an idea that's better than the idea I had, it's like, oh, oh, sure. Okay. I like <laughs> yeah. it. You know, like you just made me happy. That's brilliant. That's even better than what I, hang on a second. I got to write that down. You know? yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so 
I'll roll with that too, you know, because I'm not really interested in much as I like to say that I'm ruthless and evil. I'm, I am interested in having fun. So say, you know, you mix it up. Um, but, um, yeah, we, we were talking about stuff in the book. Oh, yeah, we had that question. Any other questions? I did want to cover any questions if people had questions and stuff. Sure, yeah. Uh, I have another question, um, or there was another question here. It wasn't necessarily pertaining to the book, but um, okay. it's from James Seymour here. Maybe we can just touch it real quick. He says, hmm, which is better, original D&D &D or the rewritten clarified modern versions referring to clones? And, you know, I have oh. like I have like this here, you know, uh, white box well when we talked about that earlier you know um i think that uh you know the problem with the uh, the, the rewritten clarified versions is that i really question whether the people that rewrite and clarify really understand the, the premise of the original rules and i might read it and be like you don't even understand <laughs> 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 like, eh, eh, it's, the, it's actually mean, a clarified version of first edition i know there's like uh, the bx stuff like old school essentials well, but i'm not sure yeah. Like, Osric is essentially like first okay. edition rewritten, but, but you're going to get, I mean, it's like with Dan's rules, it's going to be filtered through the designer of the rules and they're sure. going to have mm -hmm. a very specific perspective on what they think things are. Um, yeah. Um, I'm kind of in, in the camp, a very small camp of, of sort of abstraction to the point of almost surrealism when it comes to rules. And so I don't think the rules should be as literal as people think they are. Um, and, uh, um, and the more I read now that I'm older, the more I realize that I don't think, I think they kind of, they had this really, I remember playing really early on and there was this real sense of like things sort of being a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And you never really, you never really nailed it down. It's like, sometimes it was a little bit of this and sometimes a little bit of that. And, uh, and it's hard to explain. It's like this, it's this flavor of the, of the true OSR that, uh, like an attribute doesn't necessarily represent uh, a very specific thing, like dexterity, for instance. You know, like it's if you have thieves, it's the thieves' primary attribute, and the thief. Um, but the thief doesn't even in in OD and D doesn't even get a bonus based on their dexterity. They just have a higher dexterity. Like an eleven thief dexterity thief has the same aptitude as an, an eighteen dexterity thief, if I recall correctly, and um. um I think I looked through the Greyhawk supplement looking for that and I couldn't find it. Um, and so, uh, but what the thief does get is this uh, bonus to experience. You know, you, I think it's 16 or higher, you get a plus 10% or something like that per adventure. And so uh, it's, it, it really speaks to the idea of aptitude and, and, and uh, you know, you are more likely to learn your craft faster than others because you just have a knack for it. And, I always use the, the computer whiz kid thing, which I guess maybe these days everybody's a computer whiz kid. But <laughs> back in the seventies, we really had them, and I, I, you know, I grew up around those kind of people. And like, while I was like slogging away trying to understand Fortran and Basic, they were just like, you know, <laughs> off, you know, off the charts. Like I'm the level three programmer, and they're like level eighty programmer guys, you know, and. Uh, um, yeah, so I think that that's, I don't know if that makes sense, but I think it's, I'm circling around this idea, but this is a really important idea about the old way of playing is the idea that, 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 that you have aptitude in your profession. So a fighter gets experience, they get aptitude, they get their experience gives them a lot more hit points. It gives them a better ability to hit. Um, really that's the only, you know, their, their saving throws get better. Same for the other classes. And then instead of doing something like Pathfinder, where you've got to go through like every potential interaction you can have with reality and create a skill for it, like there's a, you know, yeah. how to sip out of a shot glass skill. <laughs> yeah, plus 30, 30 on my drinking scotch skill. But um, <laughs> um, the, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, so, so I don't think that's necessary. Like I think that there is so much stuff that unless it's, Unless it's something where a player may feel like something is going to happen that's not fair to them if you don't give them some sort of odds, you know, or a benefit, um, there's no reason to rule any of that. And that's that's where you get into these this min minimal. I mean, there's the the, the what do they call them? The, the free Kriegspiel roll, FKR or something like that. 
um, where they want to use as few rules as possible. And that kind of gets into like a weird cultish sort of thing of like, I'm not going to use any rules. And it's like, well, you, need you know, you kind of, yeah, you need to know. Players <laughs> want to know that they're getting treated fair. And they, yeah. and, and they also want to have that, that risk factor of like you were saying, your brother likes to roll the dice, you know, it's exciting to hit the number, right? Mm -hmm. When you do, you know, it's like going to Vegas in D and D time. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah. So those two things I think are essential is the fair, the fairness through rules when it comes to, to conflict. resolution. But you've also got games like uh, castles and crusades that do everything by saving throws instead of skills and stuff. Everything yeah. is just saving throws and depending on your class, uh, you know, you've got your prime statistics and stuff like that. And so you get like higher chance to like more well on those, but, mm -hmm. uh, but, but people like that system because it doesn't really matter how high level you are, like because it's saving throws, everything is always going to be like you know pretty deadly to you. Yeah, right. it's like you have like a really high prime stat, basically. I, I like don't know. You know, it's interesting because I'll hold the whole the whole way. I mean, I talk about Dungeons and Dragons because I did all the research on Dungeons and Dragons, and you're talking about like the castles and crusades and mm -hmm. uh, uh, all these. There are all these other systems that use other mechanics. Um, one of the interesting things is like you kind of come full. Well, like I run when I go to Gary Con, I run uh, Fletcher Pratt's naval combat game, naval warfare. And it's interesting because what you're talking about with all these games, you're talking about simulating, simulating things with dice, you know, mm -hmm. things that real things with dice. Um, we're modeling stuff, sort of, you know. Um, and so Fletcher Pratt is kind of fascinating because it probably was a big influence on on D and D. And D and D is then a big influence on all the other games, along with the war games that are out at the time, as far as me me you know mechanics. Um, but um, it had like if you go to Jane's Fighting Ships, I think they have a website, Jane's Fighting Ships. You can go there and you look it up, and you can say like you know Italian cruiser Trieste, and you get all the stats for the ship. And the first thing you get is tonnage, and that tells you how big it is. Well, in in uh, in Fletcher Pratt, your tonnage determines your hit points. Mm -hmm. So like. The bigger the hull, the more hit points you have, and then you have, then you go look at other uh, things that a a ship might have. So you've got like primary guns, you know, you got this many turrets, you got like fifteen inch guns, three on each turret or whatever, and so uh, that's kind of like your fighting ability. And in Fletcher Pratt, the difference is in Fletcher Pratt, as you lose hit points, as you go down the scale in hit points, you hit these boundaries where you start to lose uh, ability to do things. Mm. And so it's like this, you get this sort of granular loss of ability as you get more and more injured. And, um, you know, torpedo tubes, the same thing, secondary guns, tertiary guns, but you create this ship and, and they've done, it's an old game from about 1937. They've done simulations and, and the results, the gunnery results and, and are, are very realistic compared to actual wars in ships in the in the like World War One, World War Two time period, and so what you're seeing is kind of a character, right? As far as me mechanically, you're seeing a character, and so you, like you think about like um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Steve Jackson when he was still with metagaming. I think he was still with metagaming when he when they, when he did Car Wars. Mm. Yeah, I hear people talk very fondly of Car Wars. Yeah, Car yep. Wars is awesome. And but really all it is is it's just, you know, you have this mechanism for building cars. And instead of experience points, you're using money, you buy stuff and you attach stuff to your car. Mm. Right. So you can like as you know, you're gonna play with your buddies and you can be like, you know, getting tired of playing these like first level games. Let's everybody gets like a hundred thousand dollars. You get to build whatever you want, you know, two cars if you want, or one massive car. Um but mechanically you're building kind of what a character is in an RPG. Um, and so a more of what a character is in an RPG, like for say Pathfinder or 5e or maybe 3.5, like very much more in this range of like purchasing things and designing things, you know. Um, um, I forgot where I was going with that. Oh yeah, so it's kind of interesting that, you know, we have these war games that influence D&D, &D, the creation of it. And, and they sort of stripped out a lot of the stuff that was too mechanical to keep it much more of a verbal exchange and much more of a negotiated game. And then now we've come sort of full circle to we've got <laughs> these games that really have more in common with playing a game of Fletcher Pratt than they do with playing in Blackmore or playing D and D with Gary Gygax. Um, and so uh, that's why I keep like ranting about like 
even if you don't want to play the system, you should at least try finding one of these old DMs that can teach you the old methods and show you how the old methods work and how it feels to be in a game in the, you know, when you're using the old methods. You know, uh, Calstaff in here, he's... Which he says, uh, because of your rulings over rules, he says, Griff's a hashtag gross nerd. <laughs> I'm a gross nerd, yeah. too. I, I, oh, I'm, I, you know, I found um, our research group. We had a, uh, when we made the movie. Um, yeah, rulings over rules is kind of like, um, that's something that uh, uh, Tim Cask says a lot, too. You know, so that's definitely not just a, like a Twin Cities or Blackmore thing. I think that that's also in the early Greyhawk thing. And I think. Ernie would probably say the same thing, you know. I mean, he does in his books. You know, you read one E and he's like, anything yeah. you don't like, don't use it. <laughs> so. Right, right. And that's um, definitely harder to do these days because everything is so more strict. So if you make a ruling that go goes against, like, what the players believe is in the book, they get mad at you. But, yeah. And that's kind of the, yeah, the whole thing yeah. with, like, people fighting about over canon and stuff like yeah. that. And that's part of why, like, uh, I just... You know, I'm just going to run my own game the way I like to run it. And I'll point at the door if you, I mean, it's like, I don't want to argue with you about my world, right? Uh, um, well, especially as a DM, like, it's kind of disrespectful. Like, I, when I DM, I, you know, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of prep. It takes, it takes an investment. And someone's doing all that for you as a player. Yeah. So that you can, so that you can have a good time. The least you could do is just kind of like let the DM run his game. <laughs> right. You know? Mm -hmm. Well, and I watch other DMs like um, um, Rich, who Rich, who's uh, uh, Bards of Greyhawk. I was playing in his group. They were playing Hackmaster. And I didn't really like Hackmaster rules because it's just like tedious for combat. I don't like tedious combat. I'd rather just play a war game. Um, like if I'm going to spend four hours in a, in a battle, <laughs> let's get out the, med you know, the medieval miniatures or the Civil yeah. War miniatures or whatever. And let's just duke it out with armies instead but um i did pick up like i just picked up some style from him i was like wow i kind of like like in the interstitial stuff where he was just dming in the traditional way i was like okay i gotta remember to do that one you know that's a really great idea for for creating tension in the situation or something like that um uh, i'm rambling again but um i was wanting to get back to something and i forgot what it was um when we were doing the movie, though, yeah, it had to do with working on the movie. Oh, well, it's lost. <laughs> um, <laughs> Happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, like, you, you can see on the screen all these different, like, the, the big thing that I was into was all the different die rolls um, um, and, and the psychological aspect of the, that, that I feel is, is the responsibility of the Dungeon Master. And Arneson did that. That was what I was going to say is, like, they, you know, the guys that played originally in Blackmoor, Arneson hadn't thought to let the players roll the dice for themselves. Mm. And so you have people like Greg Svensson who um, he rolled up his character. Uh, Arneson just kept his character sheet on a little card. You know, Greg never saw his character sheet again. He never knew his stats mm. or anything in the game. And then when he did stuff, Arneson would just roll dice and tell him what the results were. Okay. And uh, I prefer to have let players roll the dice because there's a lot of engagement there. But it's pretty astounding to me that they were doing that. And clearly, Arneson was like a phenomenal dungeon master because he could keep a table full of people just like on the edge of their seats as he was doing this, you know. And they're not doing anything except for saying what they do and finding out what happens when they do the thing. Did, did he hide the rules then when, when he would do that? Were they hidden rules? Well, nobody... That was kind of the beauty even of the early days of D&D &D, is that because the rules were subject to interpretation um and i mean i'll talk i'll speak to the arneson thing i mean we debate that in our in our circle of uh oh that's what i was going to talk about now i remember the thing i got to remember <laughs> came that. back yeah no we were talking about well it was call staff was saying that i'm like a you know like a a, a gross nerd or something like that <laughs> and um all the stuff about like sort of the old school ways of doing things like i've been saying this stuff since i was a kid and uh, my research team when we were, when they were doing research and helping on the movie, one of the guys stumbled across an old issue of Interplay magazine, which was what Metagaming produced. It was like a little, it was like a D and D book sized fanzine for, for their games. A lot of a lot of sci fi stuff, 
And uh, I had written them a letter and I complained about this article where somebody had submitted this set of rules for priests and I felt like it was overblown and it was giving priests too many powers. And I provided an example of what I felt the character should be. And uh, um, so I've been like, I'm, you know, I have proof that I have always been a grognard from when I was about 16 years old till now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I, I just was like, I had the old, I'm, I'm old school. Um, and then you run into people like that even now. Like I run into young guys that are like, guys, guys, women, whatever. I, I use guys, but I'm not being specific. Folk, folk. <laughs> I run into folk, young folk. And the young folk, some of them are very old school. Um, uh, so, yeah, but um, just to address what Callstaff was saying, but moving forward with, uh, we were talking about, uh, can you remind me what it, can you remind the show so we can hear back what it, where I was? <laughs> something. Anyway, I lost the thread. Um, well, I think I'd ask if, if Arnest had hit his, hit his oh, rules because because it was, you know, he said, you said he That was the place. issue with the research side of things is that there's a lot of debate of like where the rules were. Um, and we've seen, you know, there's uh, like Dan found this set of rules that we think predates, might even predate Gary. Okay. Because there's just nothing. In, it, it hints at chain mail, but we don't even know. Yeah, it just, it just hints at chain mail. It's a set of rules that is derived from Arneson's rules. We think it's ba that Richard Snyder wrote them. Um, and uh, uh, Snyder refers to Blackmore, and it's for, and it's a set of rules for his own world setting. And he refers to Blackmore, and uh, he, you know, he references Blackmore and says like, with uh, for 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 mass combat, we will use the Blackmore system. I think it was for the mass combat. Um, and so uh, that's just interesting because that speaks to the fact that Arneson had his own system for mass combat. I'm inclined to think that whatever they had was probably based on uh, Strategos A, which is the ancients version that Arneson wrote with Randy Hoffa, which interestingly enough has hit points in it. It predates Chainmail by like three years or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it has hit points in it. Um, and that's the other thing, like the whole, you know, like chain mail and D and D I think Arneson said he was using chain mail to get Gary interested in like, Oh, somebody's done a variant on my game. I should publish that. Right. <laughs> um, like, you know, Gary's name, I think Gary's name is on Tractix. He never did anything on Tractix. He just put his name on it to help sell it. You know, and that's fine. <laughs> because that's business yeah. though. Like, yeah. Yeah. Sure. You know, like if I could get Gary and Gygax back to life and just like Gary, you know, I just like your name at the top here so we can sell a million copies you know <laughs> it's okay you don't have to write anything just put your name let there. Us use your name there yeah yeah i mean that's business but um um so yeah what uh, we were talking about yeah just old rules so uh arneson's rules are always in motion you know and he's always kind of like evolving things and uh we see interesting things like greg svenson talks about his 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 wife um uh was it zimena his was his wife in Blackmoor, and uh, he rescued her from a slave pit in in uh, in uh, Vestfold and brought her home and made her his wife. And she's got an, a charisma of twenty. You know, <laughs> that's two more than you can roll. Um, <laughs> and then I I've seen character. I mean, it's just like the rules. They're always like sort of up for grabs. Arneson was always toying with the rules, you know, and what you could do with the rules. Um, but what that's is how you it? That's how you innovate, though. You know, that's how you make. Yeah, yeah. You know, especially through play, too. You know, that's. Well, and if you're a creative DM, you know, there. I mean, it's okay to be a DM that wants to write, run it by the rules because you just feel confident working within the constraints of a, a written set of rules and playing it straight like that, right? Um, but if you're somebody like me who's always just jacking around with everything, it's like, no, I want to, like, do other things, you know? Um, I want to add in other things or I pl I've played this other game and it has a better system for doing this one thing. And um, I want to like put that into my rules. Like, um, I would say for a new DM, you should probably run rules as written as best as you can just to get a feel and a flavor and an experience for the game. I would say for a new DM, you should just not care if you mess up. That too. You know, but I mean, like that's the biggest thing is like DMs get really hung up on like doing it right. And it's like, 
look at your players. Do they even know that you've got a <laughs> No, they don't. I, they mess up constantly, even now, and my players seem to enjoy my game, so whatever. <laughs> same, with, same with me. I mean, I make mistakes all the time. I, yeah. I have my own little, uh, you know, I did, it was funny, in our last game, I, I did uh, my game here, Atomic Punk, and we were playing oh, wow. it, and uh, Vic here was like, hey, you're not even using this rule here. <laughs> yeah, right, it's your own game, and you're not using it, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm oh, the... Yeah. Yeah, oh, I forgot. <laughs> the worst. I'm the worst at, at having ideas for, for for encounters and stuff. And I do sort of like crib notes for encounters for myself. So I'll just have a piece of paper and it just has a list of encounters that I made up. And these are the things that the players can run into if they go different places. And I'll just forget like, like oh yeah, they were, they were supposed to find the flaming sword in that room. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, I guess it wasn't there this time. <laughs> you know? and I would, that's why I can't run modules because I read other people's prose for describing things and it's so complicated. You know, the players arrive, you know, and they see this and then this happens. And if they do this, that happens. And I'm just like, I, I don't know, you know, like. Well, that's why I appreciate modules that I, I know people, this isn't for everyone, but it's just like, here's a map and the monsters that are in it and you can construct whatever you want out of that bare bones thing because then that that leg work is done for me the, the dungeon map is done and it's filled the rooms are filled with stuff right. and, it, and i can kind of like yeah spring, springboard from there i really like that sort of module if it gets too narrative like i'm not a fan so yeah you feel kind of chained down too much you know i mean i like reading modules um i don't do it as much as i used to but like i don't know there are some classic modules like um city state of the invincible overlord um, they have a little booklet that comes with it that describes all the all the storefronts, okay? In just but they do it the way you're talking about, like you know, this is a candlestick maker. He lives there with his wife. He, he's a good dude. You know, if you if you need help, he'll come and help you. You know, something like that. And then maybe at the bottom it'll be like rumor. You know, he's heard that you know the orcs are trying to like damage the sewer systems so that people have to leave the city. I don't know, something like that. But it's just really, you, you just go. But it's like, you know, it's about this thick. You know, it's not huge. But there's like, I don't know, there must be 300 different little storefronts in there. <laughs> and and uh, and you can rename everything and use it for another city, right? Yeah. yeah. I need a yeah, shift yeah, stuff I need, around. Yeah, the characters are already pre-generated and everything. And um, so, yeah, that's like one of the ones I really loved reading was, um, well, the, the creation of the, I think a lot of game stuff, people buy it because of the potential that it, it promises. And so you buy the, the module because you're going to read it and it's going to reveal all this potential of like how to play a really interesting game. And um, after a while, you read again, we're back to the do you even have time in an average lifespan of 60 <laughs> to 80 years to play through all that crap? No, you don't. Um, but, uh, um, I don't know. It's fun to read modules, you know. I, I like reading modules too. I got a question here from James Seymour, and it's pertinent to uh, Tonisborg. It says, what mm. book sources uh, show you how to play in the original ways? And I would say, uh, point this way. I know of only this one. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is it right here. Um, this one, um, I'm just joking. You know, well, I think that uh, if you can get a hold of a copy of Holmes edition, Holmes Basic, there's actually, I was on Reddit and I was, I just always post people on Reddit. I'm always like, just get a copy of Holmes. And I have a link to where there is a copy of Holmes just as a PDF online for free. Mm -hmm. And it's out of print. And I don't think it will ever be in print because um, um, I don't think that, well, the Holmes family, I don't think uh, the owners of D&D &D and the Holmes, uh, uh, like his son, can come to an agreement for how to go about splitting mm. up the, you know, the ownership. I mean, you got this big corporation that just wants to like stomp on people and own everything. Like we saw with, uh, what was that setting that was made by those women that they like made a big stink about, but, um, um, so it will, it will never be republished. And so when people are like, well, you shouldn't publish, you know, it's like, eh, you know, they're not going to publish it. It's out of print. Just get the PDF, just type in, uh, Holmes basic D and D PDF boom you'll be there. That is an incredible volume for learning how to play original style D and D. &D. Um, Holmes introduced an initiative system with, with uh, based on dexterity, 
And I, I play, see, this is where Dan and I disagree on things and the rules. Like I, I do not use initiative in the game. I use parallel actions. I've always used parallel actions since the seventies. Um, parallel actions comes out of war gaming. It's like my, my unit gets to hurt your unit. Your unit gets to hurt my unit. Then we resolve morale, you know, or we decide what we do next. That's kind of how like how a uh, classic traveler plays, you know, yeah. where, you know, where everything's just simultaneous. Everything's just happening at the same yeah. time. And yeah. uh, it, it makes combat feel fast and deadly, I think, as well as, uh, you know, I yeah. don't know. It, it just feels yeah. a little more like the chaotic of, of, of battle, I think, in a lot of respects. I like that aspect of, of Traveler. I in wish I had one. played more Traveler when I was a kid, because um, that's such a great game. It is. I've been doing a video series on it. I've just finished really? uh, the last video I, I went through the three little i have the facsimile edition are those the short videos that keep coming up in my feed about how to play traveler and they're like 10 minutes long uh some of them are longer than 10 minutes but uh yeah that must be you yeah i think that's yeah. you not many people talk about traveler it is a game that now we're talking yeah. about traveler and not your book but it is a game that deserves a little bit well, of I mean, love. <laughs> I don't know, we've kind of like played out the whole i mean i've got you know we did a lot of things for the movie like when we were doing the movie we were trying to just generate cash to pay back what we'd spent on the movie. Mm -hmm. um, unlike, you know, there's a, a hand, a grip of movies that uh, one of them got like a half a million dollars and nobody's ever seen a movie. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that fun? Love Kickstarter. Um, yeah. There's some other evil people on Kickstarter right now that just don't deliver. And it's just like, God, you guys suck. So, we were really far along with our movie before we even did a kick before we even went public. We were further along before we went public or before we did a Kickstarter. Um, Chris would always ask me like, oh, how much more time do you think it'll take to get the movie done? And I'd be like, Oh, I don't know, a year, year and a half. I said that like about six months into the project. And I said that about <laughs> seven years into the project, <laughs> six years into the project, you know, it's just like, it's a bear, but, um, yeah. Um, so yeah, so we did the first Kickstarter. That's where the Thomas board books came from. It was like, we need to get more cash. So they were really, you know, people paid 160 bucks for hardbound book for the first ones. Um, but they got, you know, if they're but, willing to let it out of their grip, because now they're like, oh, this is a precious, precious thing. Um, they can sell them for, you know, three times what they paid or more. Um, we also did these the dice bags. Oh, those are cool. Yeah. And, you know, there was a lot of drama around, um, like, I feel bad because, you know, our original artist was supposed to be, this is, I mean, I'll see if I can solo you again here. Yeah. Go. I won't go into that, but this is just a nice piece of artwork. You know, the dragon, the castle, um, it is, boop, boop. It's this, you know, the secrets mm. of Blackmore velvet, the dice bag with the red thing. And yeah. this, yeah. Is, this is there a bit of a anachronism, the, the camping gear walk <laughs> but um it's a good place to put my really old dice that some of them going back to like you know the mid 70s but we did that um just to talk about other things that we've done um the other thing we did and we had we took them off the website because we weren't selling a lot of them but now people are interested in them because they um the the these are these posters the emergence of blackmore posters i don't know if you can see that very well do it this way a little bit hmm. but the original like, blackmore campaign map that is really cool yeah yeah so what we did was we reproduced arneson's map and then there's like some text here that talks about the historical significance of it and then you flip it over and there's like all these other, like this is the first what i consider to be the first character sheet right here <laughs> and and it's for a napoleonic game but what's interesting is that they have six attributes just like in D D. And wow. some of them get carried into D&D. You see them in early drafts of D&D, like Wisdom originally was cunning, we're pretty sure. Mm -hmm. um, what else do we have? Just letters, you know. Um, I think this letter on the other side here is the first letter that uh, Arneson wrote to um, Gary Gygax, I think it was. Um, there's, like, you know, the, this is the original town map. Of black moon that Arneson drew. Nice. This is McGarry's copy that he let us make a copy of his copy and use it in this. McGarry was wonderful. He was like so supportive of the project. Um, um, what else? We have like all these. They're like Arneson would have this fanzine, so we extracted the uh, 
the it's called the the I don't know if you can see it very well. Boop 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 boop. Turn so that you know it's hard to get it in focus. Anyway, the uh it's the uh the Blackmore Gazette and Rumor Monger. And it was where Arneson would do write-ups of what was going on in Blackmore every few months. He would write up about what the characters were doing, where they were going. And uh, that's really significant because they did, you know, it was it was a living world. They're like hanging out in town. He was frustrated because his players only wanted to play dungeon adventures. Because once they discovered that, they were like, this is cool. You know, <laughs> we're going underground. It's mysterious. And, and you know, it's mysterious and, and it's alluring. It's like, what's behind the door? You know, what's in the treasure chest? What do we find if we go down the stairs? What's that sound? Um, <laughs> and he wanted to play war games. He wanted to do something <laughs> more like um, his Napoleonic campaign and have that, a little bit of both, right? So he just forced them into it by having the Egg of Coot being this like far away sort of, the Egg of Coot is really like, Sauron in Lord of the Rings, you know, it, the Egg of Coot drives all the Blackmoor stories. And the Egg of Coot would send forces down and attack the town of Blackmoor. And, and uh, oh, you know, I think one time they actually overran it. And, and some of the, and, and, and that, and they had enough players that people were, and people were capable of flip flopping, you know. So if you needed a bad guy, it was like, well, can you play the bad guy today? I'm like, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll be the bad guy. I'll lead the bad guy's armies. You know, John Snyder said his first, time in Blackmore, he showed up and they were doing a battle over the town of Blackmore, which is probably what's written in there. It's probably like 72 or something, 71, 72. And, um, um, and so he was like, yeah, I just, you know, I just took part in this miniatures battle and we attacked the town of Blackmore. And um, I think that one, they got beaten off finally by the, by the good guys. But um, that was kind of his first introduction to playing Blackmore was being a bad guy. And then Next time he shows up and it's like, you want to roll up a character and be with everybody in the party and be a good guy? It's like, okay, you know. <laughs> that, that's cool. And yeah. I, I think like the, the link between like switching between war game and, and, you know, what we kind of think of today in a modern sense of like a role playing game is something that's kind of lost and yeah, even definitely. alien to a lot of people. Yeah. So anyway, what I was going to say is like, you know, if people are interested, maybe we can do another order of these and, make them available on our website it's just like you know if we buy a bunch of posters and they're sitting in a box in the office and nobody's ordering them it's like what's the point sure but i think people saw that i was running a game session and i had everybody in the town and i had this laid out on like i had this map laid out on the table and my players were around it and we were playing on the original map this That's original cool. you know this copy of it and last game session i, I think i got I didn't post it, but I had a shot of uh, Bob's uh, whiskey glass next to this map, and because uh, we like to sip whiskey when we, uh, scotch. When, um, <laughs> um, I think it was the one on me, just if, in case you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, you know, we were they were wilderness adventuring on this on this map that doesn't have hexes. Um, just by I was just eyeballing it and being like, well, that's about sixty miles. If you're going through mountains, it's going to take you longer. Yeah. Um, I know sort of where the place is that you're going to have that encounter and I will do that there. Um, and, um, so yeah, so these are kind of cool because, you know, they're, they're, you, uh, we were selling them as paired sets so you could, cause they're double sided. So you could frame them and put them in your game room, but they also are just like incredibly useful. This, I mean, this is, this one's pretty beat up. I think this was the one that was taped to the box when we got the shipment is like a, a sample. Yeah. It's got tape all over here. Um, <laughs> And I just use it to game with. It's like, okay, this is the world of Blackmore. And I tell the players where everything is. You know, like you, if you travel north, you find yourself in 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 the le the land of the Egg of Coot, which is this wasteland of clay and decaying vegetation. And and there are things there. You always feel like something's watching you, or something. There is something menacing out there. And and then I'm like, if you travel further north, you come to the land of the Scandaharians. And uh, you know, lots of storytelling like that, but um, just to get in the mood, right? Yeah, um, well, I, I love maps myself too, so I see all that kind of stuff, and I'm like, I love it because I, yeah. I make my own maps. I love drawing my own campaign maps for the world, so my players adventure in. And <laughs> well, it's it's cool too because they have, it's like they have this holdover kind of from uh, um, 
Dwayne Jenkins Western game because there's a gallows in the middle of the town. Like you see that uh, that if you boop, 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 where is it? See, there's kind of in the middle there. Yes, this it's kind of out of focus, but this thing that's like do 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 that little square there in the middle. <laughs> of the, that's a that's a gallows, okay, and uh, which is sort of funny because you know in medieval times I thought they were like chopping people's heads off to execute them. <laughs> well, we got a gallows, more like a Western. So I had this character, this NPC that I created, this little girl, who's, I guess, you know, and there are these tropes, and I wasn't even trying to do the trope, but she's just got eyes without pupils, just whites, and she's like this little, she looks kind of like the girl in like the Le Miserable girl, you know, like mm. the poster, little waif, dirty, filthy, dirty, but she's like a psychic, you know, she's a seeker, and... uh so she's sitting there on the on the gallows steps, and I was like, like I didn't know where you know how do I introduce her? And I'm like, oh my god, I've got the gallows. I'll just put the creepy little spiritualist, <laughs> you know, little uh, soothsayer girl right on the steps of the gallows, just staring off, you know. And um, so yeah, Blackmore's awesome like that. There's just like so many little triggers to like get you launched into adding your own stuff to Blackmore, which is the way I think Arneson would want you to play it, you know, not not as a fixed module, but as a launching point to create your own module. So that's yeah. personal, you know, um, anyway, babbling away. I showed you the dice bag. I showed you the posters. I showed you that I don't have my DVD handy because the few copies I had, I ended up giving to everybody I knew and run into somebody and be like, you haven't seen my movie. Someone in chat was asking if there'd be more copies of the DVD, but uh, that's another one of those where we're like, you know, do we put them, do we order? I mean, um you can't you can't make an order based off of one guy in my chat asking for it so yeah it's like if we make an order of dvds it's like we got to order like at least 500 how much is that going to cost us we've been talking about doing a new version and um the original version came with a bonus dvd uh that had like two hours of just chunks of interviews so it kind of like revealed stuff that would be used in the next movie and talk you know you get to like just get to know the people more because you see them talking about all these things and get more background that in just like not not an edited sort of assembled thing but just a, a long stream of, of discussion um and so uh yeah there's like i don't know maybe 10 interviews on the bonus dvd so that was the, the debate too is like do we do the do we still do the bonus dvd or do we just do the movie without the bonus dvd like what do people want do they want to you know and do we have to do a booklet to go with it you know mm. like like one person compl a reviewer complained like I got this and it didn't have a booklet, you know, and it's like, Jesus Christ, you know, like <laughs> we're not well, freaking Hollywood. We don't have an art department. Like here, make a booklet. I don't care what it looks like or what it says. We're not like, like Watsy, you know, like that, all the debacle over that, that, uh, that sort of sci-fi spell jammer thing. Yeah. I'm sure dozy. <laughs> everybody's holding it, you know, holding their hands to the fire. Like, Oh, you're so bad. And it's like, they're a big company. They probably just said like, okay, we need to do a thing. Just, you know, get Larry to do a thing up about that race. Okay, I'll do a thing, you know. And, uh, but now, you know, it's like, ah, you guys yeah. are racist. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, it's like somebody just wasn't watch. I mean, if you look at what corporate, big corporations do, often they're not about quality, they're about quantity. And yeah. often they're just like, so just get somebody to do, you know, like, we need somebody to shovel the manure. I don't, I don't, they don't need to shovel the manure well. Just tell them to shovel a lot of manure so we can get it to the customers. You know, um, well, that's the people calling them racist are supposedly like their main fan base, but what, yeah, what do I know? I, I don't want to go into that. I just am yeah. amused. I'm amused by that stuff. I don't care. You know, I don't care about it really. Um, yeah. I got other stuff to do, you know. Yeah, Adam um, says that that bonus disc was awesome. If you do another one, I hope there's another bonus disc. So a second, different bonus disc. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about doing the, the, another movie. Um, it really just came down to, uh, you know, I hate to like, you know, well, I don't hate to talk about business stuff, but um, we're a small company. We don't have a lot of cash flow, you know. We made this movie, we made it for less money. I always say we made it for less money than the catering for like your favorite Hollywood movie. Yeah. You know? And so, and we did it out of pocket. We did a Kickstarter. We made some of that movie back, but we didn't make all of it back. You know, we're in the hole. We, we basically, 
it was kind of like purchasing a house and all you get is a hole. <laughs> we well, purchased a house and we got a hole. I, we, got we, a way we, we bought our house here, you know, and it's like your house poor, as we call it. You know, yeah, you got a house. You got, you, you got this thing, yeah, but you're poor. You this, you're poor, right? <laughs> That's kind of where we are. Only we also have houses, so it's like we bought an extra house, um, but we don't have a house. We got a hole, a debt hole, um, and so uh, the big thing that I, I mean, I always repeat this. I kind of repeat this if you've watched me on other podcasts. I do talk about this. Um, it's like everybody in the in the community. Everybody's like, yay, community! The community, we support each other, yay! You know, and like they hit like, you know, and it's like, mm -hmm. well what I need you to do is to like take that movie link and post it on your own wall and say, this is awesome. And get 10 of your friends to watch it, you know? And, um, and I do that with stuff. I like, like, I'm always telling, like, go look at this. I'm telling people, go look at this. I just did this with this guy in Wales that was doing a Welsh language and like history and the thought and, and uh, videos. And I was like, this is cool. Can you do one on the Maginogion? You know, cause I want to know more about those books that, those books and he was like okay i'll do one um but um um so yeah my whole thing is like you know here you hear out the whole thing about community community really helps each other but when it comes down to it people are just like yeah they check doom out scrolling doom <laughs> scrolling and they won't take the time to like post the link to their own wall and share it to their friends or they'll watch the movie and they're like that was great and then they just never think about it again so um when people see the movie and they're like this is a really awesome movie i i love it and it seems like there's going to be another section to it it's like in, i don't know <laughs> it's like we're broke you know like unless people start like unless people convince us that like like and we're not talking about we're going to make a million dollars it's like unless people convince us that gee griff should edit another movie for three years and and uh and then we can uh have another movie to watch about D, &D it's kind of like eh, i don't know you know maybe we just keep the footage in the vaults for now you know well, um, I have I have a link to your all your stuff in the video description here, so I'm going to tell people now go check them out. You yeah, know, and more than that, you know, post the the movie links to like if you're watching right now, post the movie link to. It's like every, I half the people here I know on Twitter don't post the link on Twitter. You, you know, it's I'm going to see it. I don't need to see it. You know, like, <laughs> find some other place to post it. That people don't talk about it. You know, um, and then I had like so many trolls when we came out with the movie. Like I tried going to like, like Dragon's Foot was the worst, you know, and uh, um, I would just go places and I would get trolls harassing me and yeah. like, you suck, you know, and there's just like some really awful places on the internet where people are just mostly interested in being really hostile to each other, you know, um, Dragon's Foot being one of them. Don't go, <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> I'm pretty narrow in the places that I frequent. And I mean, I made a, I made a gilded server where most people hang out. So like, that's, that's my quote unquote really? community, you know? So yeah. Chris and I have talked about launching like a social media site of our own, just for like, um, just, uh, uh, just like a Blackmore, like not really Blackmore, but secrets of Blackmore, like social media site. Um, cause there are tools out there that you can, um, I think you have to purchase them, but you can purchase these platforms that are sort of like Facebook, you know, and then you just make it your own world and you, people don't have to no longer have to go to Facebook, which uh, we're not going to talk about Facebook. <laughs> we call it uh, Secrets of Blogmore. Yeah. Like in blogging. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Blogmore. Secrets <laughs> of Blogmore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what else? I don't know. I mean, we're, you know, we're doing a lot of stuff. We also did, if you go to Kickstarter and look for the fellowship of the thing, you can see, there, I think there are two Kickstarters up there. We did the one for the World War II naval war game with lead miniatures. Ooh, um, I love and that was kind of cool. Yeah, because it was a game designed by um, Lonnie Gill, who is the. It was sort of like a prototype for. Uh, it may have come out before Lonnie Gill published uh, General Quarters, which is kind of a significant um, set of rules for naval warfare that people still use today. They just released a new edition of it. Um, and uh, so it was kind of cool to have that. And, and the, the miniatures were made by Randy Hoffa of CNC. Um, and he was, he's kind of like, um, you know, just a significant person in, in, well, both in the Blackmore Bunch and also within um, small scale miniatures wargaming. You know, he does a lot of ships and tanks and he even has a sci fi line that's kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, you know, we're, we just do weird stuff like that. So I think, I mean, for the moment, the best, because we're getting towards the, 
usually end around 10, 15 here. Really? Um, I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm not really done yet. Oh. <laughs> I'd like to go a little bit further. We can go, go a little ahead. further. We can go a little yeah. further. Uh, I mean, if you're if you're game, I think I I think I probably am. I well, if there's anything interesting to talk about, I mean, he really didn't ask me any questions. I just kind of rambled. You know? <laughs> it's it's all just good. like you just turn, press the go button on Griff. And it's like, rah, 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 rah. well, what's a? Uh, I'm interested. Well, before I let me finish my thought, I guess. And the the best way that people can support you going forward here then is probably like uh, getting the video, renting or purchasing on Vimeo the movie. Yeah. Um, because Amazon takes a bigger cut. So, I mean, yeah, I guess... if you can do Vimeo, that's a lot better for us. Um, really, my thing is like, yeah, rent the movie if you like it. You know, just take the time to post it to all of your gamer friends, you know, that may not know about it, you know, and tell them like this is something worth doing, you know. Um, and then you're doing, I don't another, want... you're mm -hmm. doing another Kickstarter for uh, Tonisborg. So, like, yeah, you, I mean, you you're know. gonna, this will be, and we're gonna do like a couple different kinds of. Um, this is my copy of this, which of course my cat like curled on the cover. So <laughs> like, luckily, it's got just a shiny part, and you can't see the hurl on it. But um, thanks, Franco. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, we're gonna do the hardcover of the books. We're not really doing anything too fancy. Like, there's always the you see the Kickstarters where they're doing all the like you know you get the keychain and you get the I don't know the nose trimmer or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, just ridiculous things to try to get you in further, you know? Yeah. And we're yeah. just like, look, we're going to sell you books. And I think it's just books and t-shirts. And then um, we have the original maps that were created, not the original originals, but um, Toby Lancaster, who does uh, dark realms maps. He's out of England and he sent us the maps and he also sent us some uh, like signed prints of level 10 and so we're going to do like an art auction and sale. Like some things will be just a set price. So if you want to come in, if you know, you can get a, a, a whatever for 50 bucks, like an art pack for 50 bucks. Um, and we're not taking any of like, we're not taking a cut from that for our company. We're just going to, this is for the artists to make some money off of their artwork. Um, which, you know, cause it's like they came on and, and they really supported us when they, we had problems with the other artist. It wasn't with the artist. It was just the usual drama, and I won't go into that. But um, so we replaced all the artists with all these new artists, and they just like, like here you go. Here's here's some really cool art. And those, you know, anybody who's watching that can make a comment, what do you think of the art? There should be a, like, the art is awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> um, uh are there any plans to have like a digital digital copy, or is it just going to be uh, like? physical we've talked about that too and i uh one of the guys i'm friends with um i want to say it's the guy that's what the hell is he Baka, bakashal or something like that yeah, oh, yeah. i know what you're talking about yeah. yeah i think he does pdfs and somebody started pirating his pdfs and putting them all over the dark web uh mm -hmm. or on like forge like whatever one of those places where people just get together to like do sort yeah. of pretend nefarious things and uh they basically just killed his sales and so i'm like screw it we're not going to do pdfs you know people steal them too much and um, i've talked to other people where they're like periodically they're like yeah i found this guy it was like he had my entire catalog on a website and i had to get a hold of him and smush him down and then when i got a hold of him i found out that he was like nine years old and his dad you know so i talked to his dad and i was like look i'm not going to file any charges he's nine can you just slap him around a little bit <laughs> i know that he's like really hurt my business you know um, um, I'm being sarcastic down there. You should never slap children. Um, um, see, there you go. There you go. Yeah. The, the art and what I see here, you even got the font, like, uh, old school D and D, you know, um, it's a font. I, I, I think I know what font you probably used. I, I use it in some of the stuff I make. So, cause it just has this. Old oh, in this. Yeah. I mean, there's other stuff. I don't know. You didn't really show, you kind of hung on this and didn't show the other one the whole time we were talking, but there's like the sample pages here. Yeah. Um, we talked a little bit about the thief. And yeah. Stuff. Yeah. But I, I like this font. I really love this font. It's just, uh, well, I, it's this exact same font as you find in the dungeon master's guide. And it's exactly mm -hmm. the same size. And the layout is almost exactly the same as what you see in the dungeon master's guide because we copied it. <laughs> I and, like it. <laughs> so, in fact, these books are exactly the same size as your old D&D &D books. And so they will slide in nicely 
into the shelf next to your Monster Manual, Player's Handbook, and Dungeon Master's Guide from AD&D. Nice. And in fact, this is perfectly playable with that system. Um, but um, yeah, what was I saying about that? I'm kind of ram ramble, ramble, ramble. Well, we have um, a question here too. Uh, James Seymour asks, what prompted the movie? And I think you've talked about this before. Oh, that's uh, hilarious. Like, <laughs> I had gotten I back into playing RPGs. Everybody has like the older gamers here, anybody who's got kids, okay, is going to be like, yeah, my gaming like tanked yeah. out. Once I had a kid, it was like, you know, it used to be like, yeah, let's get together and play for 12 hours and, you know, or like, let's just play all night long. I don't care if I go to work wrecked, right? But um, um, so as you get older, you play less. And finally, I'd gotten back into gaming and I started playing with this group of gamers that was Chris's. Um, just some friends like that I met kind of through Chris, my partner, business partner, co-director. Um, and uh, so I got really interested and, and I was running. Uh, I, I really liked the, the core mechanic in Pathfinder, the, the sort of the 3.0, the D20 core mechanic. So I tried running my own homebrew system with rules. The rules were like five pages long, maybe like, or not even that. I mean, they're just really simple. I just wrote down some basic concepts. Like this is what you do. And um, so I ran this, the, the mashup campaign that I talk about, which I kind of wish it hadn't ended. It was kind of interesting because it was this weird mix of sci-fi and, and fantasy. And so I had a lot more freedom to do what I like to do um, as a DM. Um, so then I went on the internet and I found, I was like on Facebook and I was like, wow, I didn't know there were all these gamer groups and I joined an OD and D original dungeons and dragons group. And it just happened to be the next day, Gary Gygax's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an Arneson fan. I read first, first fantasy campaign when it came out, when I was a kid, I had the books. I didn't have any animosity toward Gygax. I just, I had, I, my only animosity is I really didn't like AD and D. I thought it was like it's overruled. It's like everything people say bad about Five E. I say about AD and D. Like, <laughs> AD and D just sucks. You shouldn't play it. It's just garbage. It's like overruled, nerfed. You know. Anyway, um, so I go on there and I just I. Do, 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 what about Dave Arneson? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! You know, like my hair catches on fire, and um people just start arguing with me and uh um and then there was this <laughs> one guy that kept sending me messages but he wasn't entering the conversation he was just watching you know this worker <laughs> and he would send me like oh no you're right and he'd send me links and i'd be like huh that's interesting i'll just drop it into that war where everybody hates me and I'll be like, well, what about this and so it's like <laughs> pouring the gasoline container onto the fire as, as the flames rise around Griff and the mob comes for him, I'm like Frankenstein ah! running around. They're going to burn me. Ah! And um, um, so what happens? Yeah. So I, after a few days of that, I, I got kind of freaked out and paranoid because I was like, this guy's using me as a proxy in this huge war. And he's like, yeah, they know who I am. I can't say anything. They'll like block me and shut me down. And, you know. <laughs> You can do it for me, but I can't do it. You, you need, to, you know. Here's the, here's your father's sword, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. So I got really paranoid. I was like, this is weird. This is really weird. So finally, I asked the guy, you know, what, like, who the hell are you? Because he had a weird name, like some weird. It wasn't even like a real Facebook name. It was like, you know, I don't know proxy yeah. lurker of death <laughs> um and so it turned out it was just kevin mccall um, who had been dave arneson's webmaster hmm. and uh so we started talking and then he brought in we started like a little private group and he brought in havard and Raphael, and so the four of us were talking about D, &D stuff and um somehow it came up that Arneson had tried to do his own movie, which there's footage for, um, and uh, called uh, Dragons in the Basement, and the Dragons in the Basement never got completed, but there was like, there were all these interviews with all the old original people. Um, and so uh, I was like, well, gee, I'm a filmmaker, you know, I know how to do films, right? Uh, um, 
so and we've lost Victor. He's just gone away. Right when I'm telling him, I think it was Victor who wanted to know. Maybe it wasn't. No, I can still hear you. Uh, my my cat was demanding food, and it was she was getting loud. <laughs> oh, I like cats. I, I yeah, see, I would want to see your cat. Anyway, so that's how it happened. That's the story I tell. And then on top of it, I got into a fight. I think I got into a fight with John Peterson on that page. So that was like a, you know like a good foot forward, and um, 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 which you know like I like John, so don't don't like people want me and John to be like enemies and it's like, no, I like John. It's okay. Um, uh, what else? Yeah, that was it. So we just, I just started doing all this research and Kevin had weird things. Like he had a, a, a Excel spreadsheet, computer spreadsheet, Excel from Dave Arneson, which was like Dave Arneson's personal phone list of all the people in the industry. Oh, wow. Yeah, and so I just started going through that and cold calling people and just like, hi, I'm Griff. I'm going to do a documentary, you know. And um, um, yeah, I don't know. And I'm a really shy guy. So, I mean, the thing I have to emphasize is like, it's all baby steps. Like it was, I didn't know what I was doing. I'm not, I'm an, I'm an abstract expressionist filmmaker. About, about what year was, um, were you engaged in this, uh, were you the puppet for a proxy war? And then how long until? I think it was like mid 2012 or 2011 or 2012. So for six months I did research and I kept telling Chris about it. And then Chris is awesome because he's like, well, why don't we just drive up to the Twin Cities and do some interviews? You know, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> and he had been up there and we, uh, this guy, Ryan, we got Ryan, who was a local to be kind of like, he was a, just our local assistant, like catch all guy, you know? Um, I think he probably caught more abuse than he, he really, <laughs> like, I'm not a good manager. I'm kind of mean. Um, but Ryan was awesome, you know, to have there cause he kind of knew all the local stuff and, um, um, oh yeah, there's some maps. Look at that. Yeah. I'll try cool. and scroll through as you're talking to, um, and then, um, what else happened with, that? uh, yeah. So we shot the footage, we came back and we were like, well, it looks like there's a story here, but it's a huge story. It's huge. And so figuring out what part of the story to focus on was really what took the longest amount of time. Um, it looks really coherent and cohesive. And it's like, yeah, it took years to figure it out to the point where it can be presented in like just over two hours. Um, and some people have said like, why did you make it 90 minutes long? And it's like, well, it's like, it's, it's, it's an, an auteur film. We can make it as long as we want to, you know? Um, it's not like it's going in a theater. It's not like it's going on TV. Um, people who watch it take you probably watch an hour and then take a break and then watch another hour. You know, it's a long, well, it's a long you know, thing. I watched it with my wife, and my wife is not a gamer. <clears throat> she she supports my love of the hobby and everything, but she's it is not her thing. Right. And she watched it with me, and she was very intrigued as we watched it together. And you know, she has a zero interest in the hobby, and she was entertained right. and and interested in how the story unraveled and everything and its origins. So. You know, I think it. I think it does a good job of being entertaining. I didn't take a break. I I enjoyed it. So. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I think you know, like we did a test screening, like sort of a celebration screening at a local bar where we. It's like a place where we also go game, um, and uh, um, there were just random people that had come into the bar, and so I was watching those people, and I thought it was interesting that there were some women at the counter that were like, really fixated on the movie, like they were like, "Whoa, what is this? This is interesting." You know, mm. and so I think I think it may be, you know, it's there's a lot of heavy stuff in there that it's hard to make it entertaining. And so there might be places where it's a little barred down. But, um, you know, if you want to know the information once you're in and you're like, I want to know how they how they got from A to B, it's like you kind of have to have that information. Like some people complain that maybe like, I don't know, at a certain point, it just bogs down a little bit. And it's like, yeah, but. Like you need to know that or it's or you would i don't know it'd be like watching a movie where they edit out the sex scenes or something <laughs> like that. Like, that's weird we jump from here to there and i don't know how i got here but she's <laughs> pregnant now <laughs> <laughs> um, um what was your introduction into the hobby then too you know like oh what? i've told this story a lot I, I mean it's hard to say what the introduction is because i'm a nerd okay i am like a i'm a fat nerd and I always have been. And um, <clears throat> so I try to think back. It's like, you know, when you're a kid, like, I don't know, was it my matchbox cars when I was like two and a half? Was it my, 
you know, what was it? Um, when we moved to Italy, my mom started buying me toy soldiers and they had the air fix ones, the little tiny ones. Mm -hmm. And so I played with those a lot and I had some medievals actually air fix medievals. Um, so that was, um, kind of a thing. And then, um, you know, and living in Italy, you're surrounded by castles. I mean, I lived in Verona. It's a giant castle. Like it's awesome. It's a Napoleonic fortress and then it's a castle, you know? And, um, and, um, yeah, so I, and my dad, like my dad worked at this radar installation. He was a researcher and he had a radar there and it was like in a Napoleonic like fortress over the town. And so like I played in a Napoleonic fortress when I was a kid, like you want to talk about dungeons, like that place was full of scorpions and <laughs> like, like the middle, the middle shaft, like people think, you know, like, I don't know, like there, there are no safety rails in the middle ages. Like the middle shaft had these stairways that went around, you know, and it was like, I don't know, maybe five stories tall. And I'm like three years old or something like that, three and a half and wandering up the stairway to go to the next floor. And, and I, you know, I, I think back and it's like, God, man, if I would have dropped off that, <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. griff, no griff, no more griff right on his noggin. He's done, you know? Um, so yeah, that kind of stuff, you know? Um, um, and then, you know, you're just a nerd. I mean, that's all I can say. I keep saying that, like you're a nerd. I like all nerds are interested in these kind of things. Yeah, I, um, I, I think so too. I think that's I, what attracted me to, to the hobby as well. You know, I was always interested in history and medieval stuff and, yeah. I, as a kid, I was always like designing my own games too. You know, I was like, I want to make a card game. I'd be like a like eight year old kid, and I'm like, I'm gonna make a card game, or I'm gonna right. make a, a board game. And so, because I was always interested in that kind of stuff, and so then I found this hobby, and I was like, oh, it's kind of like I can kind of do that. It's everything I wanted. Yeah. 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 I mean, one of the things I remember seeing somebody had done a display at the local library, and uh, it was. Uh, like they just had a collection of plastic soldiers that were a little bit bigger. Like there are some in the opening of the movie that are white with red crosses. They're like the kind of crusader looking dudes. And it was a whole display of those. And I was like, I have to have these, you know? And so we went mm -hmm. to visit my relatives in Italy one year and, you know, lo and behold, I found uh, medieval soldiers that were, you know, and I would play with them. And um, I just, I mean, there's all these little steps. One of the things that I, that, for me, D, the D&D &D transition was like within a year of, I found my sister's copy of The Lord of the Rings. Mm. And I just, I, ne I didn't even read The Hobbit. I went straight into The Lord of the Rings. I'd never read The Hobbit and I read that. Um, and I was probably like maybe 12 or something like that. I don't know. So I read that and then I kind of lucked out because I was in this town that was really significant for computing back in the, you know, at the University of Illinois back in the 70s. It was a big deal. And so they had this big uh, computer system there. <clears throat> and on that computer system, they had this computer game called Letter D, Letter N, Letter D, D&D, &D, which I didn't, you know. <laughs> and so I thought D&D &D originally, I thought it was a computer game. I think I might have played it first in 75 or 76. And I had never seen a paper copy. And it wasn't until I moved away in 70, like late 77 that I discovered that D&D &D was actually originally paper game i thought how long it was a, a computer game and um um but the cool thing on is on the plato system is empire and they still have they have an emulator at cyberone.org and i keep trying to get like rpgers to come play empire with me i'm like come on guys get a log on come come shoot at griff and rpgers just don't it's weird everything's so segmented and i'm like an everything gamer like i want to play the war games i want to play the rpgs I love first person shooter type computer games, like real Twitch games. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I, the, I call it the trifecta. It's like you play the war games and you play the RPGs and you play the computer games. And so I keep trying to get people to come and play, uh, get, an, get a sign on it at cyberone.org and come play Empire with me. Cause I kind of, uh, to me, that's like one of the finest game designs ever done. It's sort of like risk with, uh, with like a really primitive Star Trek game hmm. where you, you're like running around trying to conquer planets and at the same time shoot at people and kill them. And, uh, oh, look at that. We've got a friend. Yeah, Who's... she doesn't want to be held right now, but yeah. Yeah, my cat's in the front window looking out at things. <laughs> but um, anyway, yeah. 
you know, that's kind of how it all started, like how I started and how it started. Um, what's hilarious is Chris recently, he, he ran into an old friend and his friend was like, oh, I still have some of your game stuff. And he was like, really? He's like, yeah. And so he went over and the guy got out this set of papers. And when Chris was a kid, like a, just a teenager, you know, like he must have been like 14 or something. He made a, <clears throat> a, 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 a thing for Gamma World. Because Gamma, back then, Gamma World didn't have, like, plant creatures. And so he made, like, sentient mutant plant creatures. Like, so you could you could roll up a plant-based character. I think that occurred later in later editions, didn't it? Yeah, and he did it, like, when he was 14, like, in, I don't know, 79 or something like that. You know, like, when the game had just come out and it was a hot new thing. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, I was like, yeah, you're a nerd, too. I mean, he's a, he's a big nerd, too. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's kind of how it all happened. You know, like Chris has been a very, uh, good partner for all of this. Like he's very enthusiastic about what we're doing. He doesn't like to be the public guy. I have to do it. You know? <laughs> and you said um, you're shy, but you're doing a good job. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> do no, job, it's, I I'm inherently shy. I, I learned how to not be shy. Um, and, uh, some of that, you know, bad jokes. Don't say the bad jokes when you're on a live podcast. <laughs> I learned how to not be shy. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. We have a good time. You know, we have other things we want to, we, we're kind of looking at for business stuff, you know, and other weird projects that aren't related to gaming at all. You know, um, in fact, the, the whole thing actually started as we were, uh, I had this idea for a, uh, a, a social media comp like system that I devised. And we were trying to get that launched and nothing really ever happened with it. And so like, I'm kind of like, can we just make some money off this book so I can like spend three months and just program this thing? Because we <laughs> kept trying to get other people to program it. And I finally realized like, Griff, you know how to program, just do it yourself. It's not that hard, you know? Like, I mean, it's, you know, a computer is just like a bowl. You put stuff in, you take something out, you change it, you put it back, you know? It's, anybody can do it, you know? But um, yeah, so yeah, we kind of just do a lot of weird stuff like that. You know, that's cool. I mean, it's yeah. nice to have a, a partner in crime like that that can, that can yeah do that. Stuff um, anyway, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to. I hope I'm not getting boring. I'm looking at the scroll and it's like, hmm. well, we Cal got... is only two out of three. Two out of three isn't good enough, Cal. You're out of here, dude. You're done. <laughs> I'm gonna block you on Twitter. <laughs> oh, Cal's only a two out of three. He's gone. Um. <laughs> Um, um what let me see here um I, I had a question about the system here too though like bringing it back to the system you you have included in the game mm -hmm. is it is it all d6s or is it does it use uh uh other i don't know dice? what dan is using i think he's using the multiple different types of dice i don't think it's all d6s um okay the ac system looks very much in line with od and d i think descending he, yeah yeah um, um, you know, you've got the alignments in there. Um, I think the alignments are pretty well, much like good and evil. Looking at the, you know, again, looking at this here, like it's, you have a full complete game. That's what was impressive to me is, you know, you got a dungeon to play in. Right. <clears throat> you got all of this, uh, advice here. <laughs> like lots yeah. of Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the first thing I would do if I got the book is I would make uh, like scans or Xerox copies of the of the uh, dungeon level maps, and I would go in and I'd start adding my own pits and extra rooms and and things and like sort of make it my own, you know. Like, um, um, there's no reason not to, you know, and and get as weird as you want to get. I mean, in some ways, Greg wasn't totally weird, but this is like, this is. Only the second mega dungeon out of the Twin Cities, you know, in '73, um, it's it's gonna have its limits due to the fact that Greg can't read anybody else's module to glean ideas. The only yeah. thing he knows is Dave Arneson's campaign, you know, and he's been playing in the campaign for two years. So, and he doesn't even know what the rules are. Like this is the first time he's got a set of rules, right? Yeah. Um, and he's like, maybe, I don't know, maybe he's like 18 or 20 there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, look, the maps are just amazing. I mean, they have so many stairwells. And um, 
one, one thing I'll say is like I, I what I love about old dungeons like this is like the it's just an aesthetic mm. thing to me, and but also like a layout design thing is the forty five degree angle, yeah, things you know, like the the fifth edition DMG is actually quite good. It has a dungeon generator in it that's actually decent, but do it doesn't even sorry it doesn't do forty it doesn't do forty five degree angles like a lot of these older dungeons yeah. do. You know, and so it just feels everything's just a square. And I just find that when my players are going through these 45 degree angle dungeons and stuff, it becomes more disorientating, kind of hilarious to say. To Especially if you align it with the grid so that they think that they're going on a north south, but really they're at an angle, but it's easier to go yeah. on like a battle map grid or whatever. I don't use miniatures, so it doesn't matter. But um, yeah, I mean, like that, uh, one of the things that's on there is uh well like you you see that it indicates which way a door opens you know and so um that's kind of a, a unique thing and that literally comes from dave arneson you know um the way he marked his doors is like little i call them the ping pong paddles um hmm. the v's there are kind of cool like they're um anything that's marked with the letter v um I used V just because it was sort of a mnemonic for like volcanism or or, or lava or something like that. Um, and the V areas are all, um, they're like sort of like these areas with little marks around them. And they're actually shafts that go down through like, hmm. I want to say maybe four levels of the dungeon or five levels of the dungeon. And so like if you fall into one of those shafts, you're going down and the bottom of it is just boiling lava and you're a <laughs> Nice. <laughs> And the other thing is, is like I think a lot of people mis misunderstand dungeons because of the way the the consumer dungeons are aligned, so that they're kind of like apartment buildings. It's like the stairs go down to the next level, right? Um, but let's say there's 50 feet between levels, which is really how it's drawn. In um, I don't know, you've probably seen this drawing out of uh, um, Underworld and Wilderness, where they show the like the relationship between the the different yeah whoop, whoop, I, I, the kind of sideways whoop, view rather than top down whoop. view of what it does yeah like. and there's like long <laughs> like there's enough space to fit all kinds of stuff between them and there's a big air gap like a big stone gap between levels right and so when you look at the maps that are on this dungeon if you look at that like some of them will start as a let me see if there's scroll down like move the map yeah either direction go oh, go back up here because it gets to the index here. Yeah, go back up a little bit. It's kind of hard to maneuver, huh? I think there's just boop, this boop, boop, in the sample. There's yeah. Only, there's only oh, there's only here. like yeah, so many. It's it wants to jump to. Um, anyway, on the other levels, they're like they'll start as a spiral on one level, and then they'll be straight on the other. And my image, the way I image those in my head is that they're like really long, like fifty foot down stairwells, and so. Like the stairwells, I like to do encounters on stairwells. They're really fun, you know, yeah. like, like hidden things in the stairwell. So, you know, people are so used to going down the stairwell and sort of, it's sort of like, it's like a I don't know, you treat them like chutes and ladders or something or like the fire pole and the fire station. It's just like, boop, let's go to the next level, you know? And it's like, no, 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 no. There's, you need to look up in the stairwells because there's stuff in the stairwells too. And that's not something that Greg did in his dungeon, but I, I do it in my dungeons. And I mean, well, that's probably, it, hmm. Well, I think that's an important bit of like advice that it kind of is overlooked. Like I, like I said, I think we kind of use stairwells in a modern sense as in a yeah. game, and it's like a loading screen, you know, yeah. between levels. It's like, right, uh, you know, press. Yeah, it's like we take the stairwell down. It's like, okay, let's get drinks and go in loading screen mode, and we'll come back and start. <laughs> okay, you get to the bottom of the stairs. You know, um, I love putting like ice on stairs. <laughs> stairs get icy, and you just slide down them, or you know, or like. You're going down the stairs and there's just something like they're like they're the slimes and things like that that it's like if you're not looking for it you're going to run into it and you're what, on a stairwell what, what about gonna... paint cans on strings uh... <laughs> what about what what about paint cans on strings sure home, anything like, like home alone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That ice made me think of home alone so <laughs> oh yeah okay <laughs> um but yeah i mean uh it's an interesting dungeon because it's so it's so different from what you'll run into anywhere else and it's very much a like it, it, I saw when I first saw the originals, I was like, this looks like a Blackmore dungeon. And I was like, are you sure this isn't like the original Blackmore maps that nobody knows about, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's something else. We don't know what it is yet. Um, 
Um, and then there are some anomalies, like Greg. There's like, I think there's a room on one level that has like five wyverns in it. Okay. And it's <laughs> 10 by 10. And it's like, I mean, I'm looking at a 10 by 10 foot area. I might be able to fit five cows into a 10 by 10 foot area. So <laughs> maybe wyvern, wyverns are more snaky and they're all piled in there together, you know. <laughs> um, but I, you know, sometimes you just don't want to worry about it. It's just a game, right? It's like, I mean. Well, like times... you said, he had only had one campaign. There's, there's, he doesn't have the benefit of anything before that. There was no published game. He got a pre-publication copy of the game and made this dungeon. Like, yeah, yeah. What, what else? You know, it's a, it's actually pretty astounding that he did that and and came up with this. You know, um. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, I hope I have been a good guest for you tonight. I always like. I never have a sense of whether I'm being entertaining enough. Oh, I think My song about, dance is limited. I, you know, I love, and I think Vic feels the same way. I love talking to you, you older gamers that have been in it, because there's so much to learn from you guys. Yeah. And uh, you know, like Calstaff and Chat here, he's he's someone that I've like really respected and looked up to. And uh, he he called you a gross nerd, but he did it ironically. He's not being serious. <laughs> well, no, when somebody, you know, uh, there was a kid. Uh, I got insulted by this kid because he referred to me as a toxic, toxically nostalgic Ragnard. And and it was hilarious because he was like posting where I could see it. So he was like this totally passive aggressive jab at me. And I was like, yeah. like, and at first I didn't really realize he was talking about me. And then when I realized he was talking about me, I was like, I kind of like the title, you know? So now <laughs> I call myself a toxically nostalgic grognard. And, and, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, you know although that. I like to call the old gamers liches. There you go. That's a good one. Yeah. I like I think that. that. Us old gamers should start referring to ourselves as liches. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of old knowledge, and it's easy to like for it to get lost, especially with like you know the new breed of players that like like yeah. you said like they do look down on the old players and actively like try to like distance themselves from them. And, well, it's um, unfortunate that we have the the sort of schism, you know, this yeah. sort of ageism schism. I had a kid call me a boomer, and it's like. Dude, I'm not old enough to be a boomer. <laughs> but it's like they, you know, the people who created it are, are the boomers. I'm yeah. the next generation down that bought it. I'm the consumer of a generation, just like you, sucker. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, um, yeah, I don't know. I forgot where I was going with that. But I think there's just a, a very big difference between I, I. If you read my blog, I did a whole section about called understanding original OD and OD and D where I sort of analyzed and broke down some of the things that are in the original rules and how even with the original rules, they uh, nerf it a little bit so that players don't die as easily. Um, and uh, um, part of that is just because it's like if every combat is a 50-50 chance of winning or losing, you know, you're not going to explore a lot of dungeon, right? <laughs> no. Um, but then I also write a lot of articles about like, you know, uh, military tactics in relation to uh, dungeon exploration and how really the the you know intelligence is the most important thing i mean you're watching it with ukraine right now it's like you know their intelligence is phenomenal because some other country is giving them information and they're being very <laughs> successful um and so uh um you know with all the stuff like i listen at the door you know, you do that so you can establish what's in there. Like, oh, it sounds like there's five of them, maybe. I hear five different voices, you know. I listen for 10 minutes, and it sounds like there's five of them. And like, well, there's eight of us here, so, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, like, um, people don't do the, like, even in the verbal game where you're not using miniatures, it's like you got the three guys in the front rank fighting. When the, one of the fighters gets hit, you pull him back, and somebody else jumps into his spot, and, you know, the, the cleric is applying paddles to his chest to revive <laughs> them, and the new guy's in the front line now, right? Yeah. And um, and so you're rotating people into the front lines. You're using your reserves to make sure that you're, you know, you can still overpower instead of just leaving everybody up there till they get hacked to death. Um, and so yeah, like intelligence, you know, using your assets really effectively. Uh, uh, I mean, there's, you know, it's there is there it is a war game. You know, even if it's if it's in your head, it's still a war game. You're fighting. You've got swords. Um, and so uh, that's stuff I write about a lot, too, is the idea of the unbalanced encounter and how it is up to the players to rebalance the encounter. Reality doesn't have a CR. So if you're <laughs> walking down the street at night and you peer around the corner and down the alley, there are 10 guys lurking there. You go, hmm, 
I'm not going to cross the alley. I'm going to run the other way as fast as I can <laughs> and rebalance this encounter, right? But the balance will be putting like about 500 feet between me and those jerks hiding in the alley. Um, and that's what, play, you know, players don't do those things. I, I just see, all I see is we wade in and we kill it. We wade in and we kill it. We wade in and we kill it. I, um, I think it's because the game mechanics are more in favor of players now. Like if you look at Watsy D and D, especially what they're doing, yeah, it's, with video, like, it's video games. Yeah, yeah it, it, what they're doing with one D and D, even it's just like more options for the players. Make make it harder for players to die. Like they they try and remove any sense of of threat. You know, um, that like, isn't that like that isn't even D and D anymore, as far as I'm concerned. No, it's not. You, you well, five E to me doesn't seem like Dungeons and Dragons. I'm sorry. I hinted at this earlier, but they actively tweet to the GM sometimes like he's an asshole if he does like like you know rulings over rules or like uh, if he doesn't like you know pay proper attention to the player backgrounds and like doesn't like does all this work to like weave it into the world and into the story. Then he's like some jerk, and it's like, eh. like I don't I don't like that new type of uh, right. Like, I don't know. Play how you want, right? Yeah, just, yeah. Just don't, don't bring it to leave, my table. <laughs> don't leave yeah. me alone. Yeah, just leave me alone, though. Yeah. But um, for those who are interested in the old ways, you know, I mean, I don't know. It's sort of it's amusing to me because I still feel like I'm about fourteen. You know, I'm just a big fat nerd. I'm fatter now, but I'm still a nerd. Um, and so it's sort of amusing to be sort of like a, a you know, like a an old school dungeon master now. Um, but um. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the book, uh, I have some, I have some, I never got to complete it because I had all these computer problems and all the data is sitting on these hard drives that I don't have access to right now because I'm too lazy to take that computer apart right now. But um, there's a set of uh, game sessions where I ran some guys through Blackmore, just like, you know, in, in, in the way I like to run now which is sort of a hybrid of old way, new way. It's my own way. It's based on my old way and my new way. Um, and so I run, it's, I think you can find it if you look for the fellowship of the thing, or if even if you do like Blackmore live play um, and on YouTube, you should be able to find it. And there's like three sessions there. I got to put the others on there. I was in the middle of editing them when the, when the computer broke. I was just uh. like, oh. And so now I've got to redo all the work I did too. That's Ooh. the other side of it. But um, um, it's just kind of an example. I mean, I nerfed that game a little bit just because I wanted to guide them through the game and sort of use it as a demonstration, you know. Sure. Um, but it shows. I think it shows a different way of playing. Um, um, yeah, I don't know. People who play with me at conventions. I had a guy play at Gary Con this last time, and he was just like, "Dude, that was the best RPG game I've ever played in my entire life," you know. And he would. And he. And then he started messaging me on social media. He was like, how, you know, like, what are you using? What are the thing? You know, I was like, oh, I think it's, a, I think you can find it over here, you know. But I was like, yeah, you don't need a lot. Um, you just make it interesting, you know. And the big thing to making it interesting is the level of threat, which is what we talk about in the book. Like um, the different, yeah. you know, there, there are headers for like different types of die rolls um, and also just like creating a, um, where is that? You got a couple of things here, like the fake role, the pre role, yeah, the yeah, that, role, the paranoia role, the um, quiet game, and the psychology. The quiet game. When we talk about the quiet <laughs> game, that's Rob Kuntz, um, who was the the co author of I think he was co author of Greyhawk Supplement, um, and he also wrote on Blackmore Supplement, although I don't think he's credited there. And he was like, I mean, he had, he lived with Gary Gygax. He was probably like twelve years old when Gary was making D and D, so he's like, you know. He, he got to be fly more than fly on the wall. He got to play, you know, when they were doing it. And um, he really analyzes things very deeply. And, and, uh, and when he talks about the, this idea of the, of the, the, uh, the quiet game, I think that's like a really significant thing that people aren't aware of is the psychological aspects of um, the quiet game. Or, I mean, cause what you're doing with the quiet game is you're reversing the action. Okay. When you're playing mostly it's like, okay, you come down a hallway, it splits down at the end. What do you want to do? And the character's are like, okay, we're going to advance slowly, you know, tap in the ground for pits or whatever, whatever stuff they do. Okay, you get to the intersection, and, and as you look around the intersection, you see it goes this way and that way, right? And then, but then the quiet game is is like you're, you stop giving out information as a dungeon master, and it's like, okay, you, where are you standing? 
you, what are you doing? You know? Um, and, and then you, and it's like, they've already, they already have gotten to where they're going, but you trigger the quiet game by asking them questions. You're not telling them information. You're asking them questions. I want information about what you're doing. I you know. And, I, and hmm? I, I do that to my players too. And you're right. It does. It messes with them. It's funny. It's like, yeah. Cool. And it's the minute you do it, you know, or, <laughs> you know, there's always the, the other one is those, the, the, the various roles, you know, like the, 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 uh, the fake role, you know, it's just like, like, you know, you describe it, what you want to do. They're like, okay, we're going to do this. And then, or they're talking to each other and you just roll a die. Yeah, I do that too. <laughs> yeah. Everybody. Yeah. I mean, these are things everybody does. It's not documented anywhere though. Like this is, that's why this book is so different. It's like, you got the oldest dungeon, you got, you know, uh, you got the oldest dungeon and then you've got all this like very detailed description on how to play in the old way and an old set of rules. Um, I don't think there's anything like it out there actually. Um, um, just a lot of people trying to rewrite the rules, but nobody really talking about how to be a DM. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, just things like that, like that, the quiet game though is awesome. You know, whenever you use it on players, it's like, it's terrifying. The minute you, because then they're like, I'm scared to do anything. <laughs> you know, like, okay, where are you, you know, like, okay, I walk over to the door. Are you sure you want to do that? That's the other great one. Are you yeah, sure are you, you sure? Yeah. Because <laughs> you, know, you make them double down. It's like, yes, I'm walking to the door. Okay, you're dead. You know, like a brick falls out of the ceiling, hits you in the head, you're dead. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, but it's like they said, I'm walking to the door, right? Um, so they, it's their, they like, it's, a, it's you asking them to agree to a contract that could lead to a very bad result for them, you know? Yeah, it's um, like you're not killing the player character. Uh, they killed themselves, and you just kind of facilitated it. They always do, don't they? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, I'm going to go on and on. I just worry that I'm going too long. We're at, what, a quarter to 11? We're almost at three. This is the longest one I've ever done. I know Vic's getting tired. He looks tired over here. He's he's, well, over... he's on another time period. Like time yeah, yeah, it's seven a.m. He's like in the so... middle middle ages. I'm also half blind right now, and that's also making me tired because I'm just squinting at everything, right, and everything's right, like right. blurry. So, <laughs> but uh, I, I've had fun. I think we could probably call it here. Um, yeah, I want to, you know, I want to point people to the links in the video description. Check out uh, Griff's blog. When you do do the Kickstarter, let me know and I will share the heck out of it. I mean, it, it's you know? we'll just post it on Twitter. You follow our Twitter. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. I mean, everybody says, just let me know. And I'm like, I got 300 people to let you know about it. Like, yeah. get on the mailing list on our website and we will let you know. There we go. You know, like, you can just sign up to be on the mailing list. And yes, we will email you and let you know that this is happening. Um, we're really close. I was fiddling with the video today because I had some format issues. Um, and then... Um, um, most of the text is all done. Most everything is done. Um, we just need to submit it for approval. And I mean, it's hard because we're doing a different, we, we always end up running into the boundaries of what Kickstarter is capable of doing because they haven't upgraded the set, the system for like 10 years, <laughs> you know, and it's not really designed to do half the stuff that people do on there. Like if yeah. you look at how people, it's weird because they, they like the, the, the little donculator that converts JPEG or that however it displays images, they, they always look kind of fuzzy on there. And, um, um, and you see so many people trying to use images to do layout. That's a little bit beyond, beyond, uh, what, you know, what their layout, uh, widget can do. And so they'll like do it inside of like JPEGs and splatter those up there. Yeah. And, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, like, you know, follow us. Yeah, follow us on Kickstarter. Follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Um, the thing I like to say with great pride is that we always follow through on our Kickstarters. It might take us a while, you know, but you do get what you ordered. Um, we, we, like, really pride ourselves on delivering the goods. Um, and we've delivered a feature film, which is no small feat. We've delivered T-shirts. We've delivered posters. We've delivered dice bags. We've delivered... <clears throat> you know, a book and we're about to re-deliver that book. We've delivered war games, we've delivered miniatures. I mean, it's like, you know, some of this, like, usually we're like, let's try to do a simpler Kickstarter. And then they always end up being more than we expected because we're too <laughs> stupid to realize that they're really hard to do. <laughs> but we always deliver and we, and, you know, we're, we're, we're 
we're really into having that track record of not being weasels, you know. That's good. I mean, I think both Vic and I are looking at doing some kind of crowdfunding in the future for some various projects we want to do. So, well, yeah. talk to me about it because I know how to do it and I can give you some good advice for free. You know? I'm uh, right. hopefully close to doing my first Kickstarter soon. So, we'll see how it goes. There is some basic, basic things we can talk about that really make a difference, you know. Yeah. And like, and the main thing is just be honest and be like real, you know, like, yeah, you know, like Kickstarter is kind of personal. Like you're going to get 500 backers maybe. And it's like that you could actually know all those 500 people on a first name basis easily enough, you know, so you can't act like you're like, oh, we're the corporation and you're the consumer. It's like, okay, yeah, no, well, thanks. Thanks. You know, thanks for coming in, you know? So, but um, yeah, I'd be glad to talk about that sometime. I'm sure a lot of people have really good tips that I don't know about for running Kickstarters, but I figured out a few. And, yeah, we, we have some uh, mutual friends, John and I, that have like had successful Kickstarters, and uh, they're on the same uh, chat server as us, so they, they're probably going to be very helpful with that. Yeah, because we've never done uh, it before. So. The yeah. only thing, like like when we ran our first one for the movie, I didn't know anything about Kickstarters, and so there's this thing where like you know the first day everybody's excited and you're like numbers are going up and you're like yeah yeah yeah, and you hit the third day and it just like flat lines yeah. right and and so i talked to people and everybody's like yeah that's normal it'll just flatline for a while and then at the end people yeah. will come in and start giving you money again yeah it's like wait so i've got to let this thing flatline for 20 days i said f that and i started busting my butt and i hit all the social media and i, I was doing updates i was posting stuff all over the internet everywhere i could and i worked it like four to eight hours a day i was like just cranking on it so that you know and and I, I turned that flat line into something that was like more of a constant thing like this, you know, maybe it wasn't yeah. like this, but um, I lifted it up and, and it made a difference. You know, it might've made a difference of like $20,000 or something like that. And, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So that's my only thing is like lots of updates. Talk to lots of people. Don't let it sit there. Like I've, I've talked to people who are like, yeah, I did it. And then I would look and nothing would be going on. And I'd be like, did you do any updates? I'm like, no, it was like you do an update every day, you know, and um, <clears throat> and you don't have to be like a corporation, have it all scheduled and planned. Just think of something like, you know, just something that's current, contemporary that's going on and talk about it. Or like I was gaming with my buddies and we use some of this stuff, you know, like whatever. Yeah. stuff like that. Um, and people know that you're there and you're not ignoring them. You know, that's the other thing is like even when you're done, you have to give a lot of updates, like a lot of people uh don't give updates when they're done and it feels like they're like they're ghosting you, you yeah know? i've been following a couple kickstarters that were really big like we're talking these people made half a million dollars you know and uh i mean 20 percent of that is probably manufacturing and fulfillment stuff but still that's a crap ton of money and i've become aware that they never had a product when they even started like they didn't have anything they just put a yeah. team together and launched you know <laughs> and i'm like really yeah like that's you know and now you're ghosting people you know yeah um, sounds like yeah. pencil dice to if it looks like pencil <laughs> dice and, and it sounds like <laughs> yeah. pencil dice it's pencil dice and you'll never have them you know yeah my, my book's already 200 pages so i'm good there uh, and i'm adding still i'm still adding some more stuff but at least there's like you know a big chunk of it already done before i even do the kickstarter so right um you know what another thing we did was when we got the book it was all laid out and ready to go. We made PDFs and we watermarked them individually. Everybody that backed us got an individually watermarked PDF mm. of the book with their name on it. And then we sent them out and we said, look, you know, we did the best job we could. Email us any flaws you see. Mm. So uh, in the text, like, is the grammar wrong? Is there a missing period or whatever? And so we crowdfunded the, uh, <clears throat> the quality control on the product. We still missed some stuff. You know, there's still like, Oh, There's a do. chart missing in one of the sections. Yeah. Somebody pointed out to me. I'm like, Ugh. you know, but um, um, aside from, you know, a couple periods and maybe that one chart, you know, we got most of it. It really helped us get the final, like just the refining stage of getting the book done. It took longer, you know, it added another month or something like that. But the book was the best book we could make, you know. So yeah, that's another note of advice for that. Maybe crowdfund your your uh, proofing. Mm -hmm. So uh, where can people join your uh, 
your your mailing list? Is that on the Secrets of Blackmore website? Yeah, yeah just go to the website, uh, Black, secretsofblackmore.com. And it should be if you scroll down right now. Oh, right here. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. You just get an, in nice. there. Yeah. And um, I think we, I think Chris removed it, but like we even, I mean, I hate to do the, the begging for money thing, but I think in our store, if you go to the store, we also have a begging for money thing for people that, hmm. that let's see, where is that? Scroll down. DVDs are there. Maybe there isn't a begging for money thing. We used to have a beg for money button. Yeah. Like give us money for free just because we're cool. <laughs> <laughs> That was, I mean, the whole like crowdfunding thing when it became like, just like a, I want to go to Africa. I need $30,000 to go on a vacation to Africa. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I always thought that was kind of strange. You know? <laughs> so, well, this is for an actual product though. Like, and I, yeah. I like what you guys are doing. So yeah, I'm going to encourage everyone to to check it out, sign up on the mailing list. I'm going to sign up on the mailing list so I can. What happens miss- when you click that DVD? Oh, it's the VOD. It's not the DVD. It's the VOD. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. We need to get the DVDs. Yeah. There's another site where, uh, well, I won't say anything about it. We're going to launch another site. Because hmm. um, we're kind of two things. Like, we're kind of, it's confusing to people because they call us Secrets of Blackmore. But we're also, the, the fellowship of the thing is the company that made Secrets of Blackmore. And so we're kind of trying to, move everything toward the fellowship of the thing because we're doing all these games and they're actually licensed like they the copyrights and everything are under the fellowship of the thing that's who's publishing it okay so, yeah. Um, um yeah i mean like there's that um oh well, this has more samples here oh yeah there you go you got you know you could play two levels now you got i don't know it's strange you know like there's all of the, the I don't want to get into fights with people, but like, you know, if you look at the classes, like it's, it's all dudes there, you know, mm-hmm. but that's just what that artist drew. You know, um, if you go a page before that, the Hobbit is actually a girl Hobbit or a, a kind of like hard to tell if it's a girl or a boy Hobbit. Um, you know, here, I, I always thought this was a woman on the edge there with the sword. Uh, that's a woman there. I think there's one right here. It's a woman. Yeah. A woman. Yeah. So, you know, um, I'm not too concerned about that stuff. Like I do when I do art for my projects, you know, I, I just draw what I feel was appropriate for the scene. And that's right. what it is. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. You have to be sort of concerned about that when you're producing a product and selling it to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we just get a variety of artists, you know, our artists are pretty diverse at this point. So, um, we're not doing the thing like a lot of companies do where they have one artist do everything or they have like sort of a, a style sheet and everybody has to draw to that style. Um, if you look at the art, it's all old school, but it's all kind of different. You know? Yeah. Um, so there's a little bit of something for everybody there. I like the Ken Fletcher cartoons, like the one at the top. Yeah, they're funny. They're, they're um, in the, yeah. the PDF at the top of the PDF you gave me. The Shield, Best yeah. General Store. <laughs> You know? It reminds me of like the AD and D rule books, you know, where there's like a lot of little thought bubbles and mm-hmm. like silly little jokes inside of it. It's just little, there's like that yeah, humor from old school that's kind of missing. Yeah, it's like, it's yeah. like the old Dragon magazine used to have cartoons <laughs> like this, you know. So, uh, yeah, those are cool. Um, anyway, yeah, we've been talking a long time. Um, but, uh, I hope you learn something new. I always worry that I'm going to say the same thing I said on the last show, you know. So I try to like, let's talk about something different, you know. Because everybody gets stuck in their rut, of their groove of what they talk about in relation to whatever they're doing, you know. Sure, I do that too when I'm on um, other people's stuff. <laughs> what's that? I do that too when I'm on other people's stuff. So yeah, yeah, you kind of like repeat yourself, you know. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, you know, I'm excited about I, I'm excited about the book. Like I read, I uh, Chris was was when he was laying it out, he was like, yeah, I was trying to lay it out, but I'd get so interested in reading what the text was that I just read it. And then he'd be like, I had to go back three pages and figure out where it was, keep laying it out because I was sort of just getting into all this stuff, you know. And um, it's been long enough since Dan and I wrote it, and Greg, Dan and Greg and I, um, that I sometimes open it up and I'm like, who the hell oh, wrote yeah. this? This is good. <laughs> you know, like, this is good. That must be Dan. It can't be me, you know. Like, um, so, you know, because we've got like a bunch of people writing on it. 
I don't know who wrote what anymore. It's just kind of this collaborative thing. It's kind of fun. Um, but yeah, well, everyone for everyone out there, get out on the mailing list. Rent the. I would just say buy it. Just, I I bought it on Vimeo. Just go out there and buy it. Uh, it's a good video to have and watch. And <clears throat> I think it's it's suitable for rewatches as well. I, I feel like I, I've watched it twice now, and I've okay. I've learned that. I learned something on the first viewing and I learned something on the second and uh, I'm looking forward to a new printing of Thomas Borg so I can <laughs> actually have it this time and right. I've seen it. I felt so stupid. I saw people getting it and I'm like, wait, did this, uh, what? <laughs> How did I miss this? I, I don't pay attention very well. So pay yeah. attention this time. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. We'll get one now, you know, we'll have heart soft cover versions this time. It'll be cheaper too. So, if you don't want to like invest that much money in, in a oh, I want hardbound. I want the baller version. So <laughs> they're, I mean, they are worth. You know, it's a small enough print run. Even if we do five hundred, like it's still a tiny print run. You know, um, it'll be worth something in a year. You know, yeah, it's not like it's going to lose value at all. Um, and if you hate it, you know, you can. I don't know. You can block me on social media. <laughs> <laughs> no, you've been very gracious with uh, your time and your knowledge. So I, I appreciate yeah. that. So <laughs> it's nice to meet you guys finally. Too. Yes. You yeah. Too. Likewise. <laughs> Have a face there. And yeah. after it must be like, is it 6 a.m. there now? Or Seven. Something? Seven. You've been up yeah. all night with us. Yeah. I took um, a nap earlier. So I right. mostly just look tired because, like I said, my eye is, uh, my, I've got, I scratched my cornea for people that are curious and I can barely see right now. So. The only thing to be done for that is to scratch the other cornea. Yeah, yeah the match, true. you know, so yeah. you're balanced. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're just completely blind. Yeah. yeah. All, All right. right. Well, and thank you, everybody. That was I. You know, I was actually yeah. watching the comments as we were talking, and so it's nice to see all the familiar names and stuff there. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and nice Shadow and Sun showed watching. up. He's yeah, I mean, I appreciate that you guys like took a couple hours to listen to me just like blather on. You know? <laughs> no, like I said, it's good. I always appreciate talking to you to you guys that are more veteran and experienced than me because, like I said, I'm a youngin and I'm I'm still fairly new to the OSR and old school gaming. I started in new school, and so I feel like I've had to yeah. relearn and unlearn some things. And so it's always well, it's always yeah. wonderful to 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 hear that kind of. Uh, I think them. that there's a fresh, like you have to keep it fresh. Like, you know, like you're talking about like see, these old guys know how to do all this stuff. And it's like, I've been really thinking a lot about how I run my games and I've been trying to like freshen them up and keep them like, I want to feel like I'm 14 years old again when I run a game. I want, mm. even as a DM, I want to be like, this is the first time I'm doing this. This is great. You know, and the players really, you know, like this really worked or this didn't work. I don't know, but I want to feel like I'm still exploring the medium of, of the role playing experience, you know, instead of like, yeah, I, I just, you know, I just phone it in. I don't even, I'm, I don't care. You know? So, All right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll call it here. We'll let, uh, Victor go to sleep and rest his eyes. <laughs> I just right. quick uh, shilling in the chat. Uh, so. We keep going back and forth because you'll say something and I'm like, oh, but wait, 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 wait. And then you're like, yeah. <laughs> You're right, Griff. What was that about shilling, Vic? <laughs> oh, I did, I did some quick shilling in the chat there. So, oh, okay. okay. Product sales, sales. Uh, yeah, I, I've got my own little OSR supplement, and it's literally three sales away from getting the copper uh, thing on Drive to RPG. So I'm Ooh. just like uh, shilling it all over right now. <laughs> yeah, help Vic okay. get to help Vic get to copper. So, uh, yeah. Send me a link, and I'll post it on my Twitter. You know, sure. and like share it around too, because I'm I'm like yeah. all about. Sharing other people's like you live. I can drop it in the the private chat there real quick for the stream yards. Okay, great. And All right, uh, ciao guys. Thank yep, you. Bye. Yeah. Let's see. I'll catch you guys yep. on the next one. Yep. Mm -hmm.